Mr. Gorbani Farr was trying to encourage us to proceed with the initiative. And he said, you support the Nicaraguan resistance, don't you? Among other things. And he said, why don't you use some of this money for that purpose? And as I described to you before we took recess, I thought it was a right good idea. And I came back and advocated it, and we did it. Even Gorbanifar knew that you were supporting the Contras. Yes, he did. His Vestia knew it. The name had been in the papers in Moscow. It had been all over Danny Ortega's newscast. Radio Havana was broadcasting it. It was in the, every newspaper in the land. All our enemies knew it, and you wanted to conceal it from the United States Congress. We wanted to be able to deny a covert operation. The Iran-Contra hearings of 1987 raised disturbing questions about the conflicts between secrecy and democracy. How can a society harbor in its midst secret arms of government? Why did these agencies come to be? What do we really know about what they do? And how do they protect us, fail us, sometimes threaten us? These are not really new questions. Similar ones have been raised throughout this century. A century in which the United States has created a vast intelligence empire. An empire both foreign and domestic, supported by billions of dollars and layer upon layer of government. In the skies, dazzling spy machines have helped avert global war. There have been secret agents and secret warriors who have changed the destinies of nations. It is a secret empire that serves as America's eyes and ears, its shield, and sometimes its sword. But the U.S. intelligence community has evolved to a level where it has the potential of threatening the very principles it was created to defend. It is this constant tension between secrecy and democracy that we wish to explore, seeking the answer to perhaps the most important question of all. Who will watch the watchers? A warning as we begin, the journey through the world of secret intelligence is full of deception. But it is possible to trace the important role of U.S. intelligence in shaping the history of our country and the world in the 20th century. That is what our series intends to do. America at the turn of the century. Isolationist, prosperous, and protected by two oceans. It is a world with little need for espionage. There is no mention of secret arms of government in its constitution, now over a hundred years old. The United States will be the last of the great powers to create an intelligence agency. Such was the mindset of the U.S. towards espionage as late as 1916. Even though war had been raging in Europe for two years, America entered the war in 1917 wholly unprepared in intelligence matters. When General Peyton March became Chief of Staff, he found that his entire intelligence department consisted of two officers and two clerks. This was not the case in Russia, a nation torn apart by civil war. Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin promised peace, land, and bread to the Russian masses. He seized power in November of 1917. The Bolsheviks made a separate peace with Germany, to the dismay of the Allies, who promptly invaded. The Allies hoped to strangle the infant Soviet state in its crib. It was an invasion force made up of Czechoslovaks, Poles, 
Japanese, the British, and over 13,000 American troops. Bolshevik power was also challenged by supporters of the Tsar and by a disaffected populace that believed the revolution was being betrayed. To wage war on the Soviet's military enemies, Lenin turned to his ablest associate, Leon Trotsky, who created the Red Army. To stamp out internal resistance, Lenin created what was called the Extraordinary Commission to Combat Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, the Chaka, forerunner to the KGB. All opposition was to be crushed. The Chaka's only rule was to win. It loosed mass unbridled terror. Anyone could be branded an enemy of the people. Thousands were arrested, imprisoned, tortured, and executed. The reign of terror, like the fight against foreign invaders, succeeded. Allied troops went home. The Soviet people were subdued. But protecting the revolution at home was only part of the Cheka's mission. Equally important was fomenting revolution abroad through military power, subversion, and espionage. Lenin convened the Third Congress of the Communist International in 1919. There, he predicted a world Soviet state by the next year. Lenin's bold prediction seemed possible. The Red Revolution surged out of Russia. Governments panicked everywhere. In the once isolationist United States, complacency was shattered by a tide of post-war labor unrest, unrest attributed to Red agitation. Across the nation, some four million American workers went out on strike. Blood flowed as police and private detectives battled workers. The unrest grew worse in April 1919, when 34 bombs in several cities were intercepted before reaching their intended victims, all public figures. A month later, however, a 35th bomb did explode on the steps of this Washington townhouse. Its intended victim was then U.S. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. Palmer wasn't hurt. The bomb thrower was not so fortunate. He was killed. But in the debris, searchers found a leaflet signed by a group called the Anarchist Fighters. It threatened violence against the capitalist class. Palmer labeled the bombing the work of emissaries of the Bolshevik leader Lenin. It was all part of a secret communist plot, Palmer believed, to bring Lenin's revolution to America. The attorney general decided he would retaliate and crush the communist movement. All alien radicals were to be rounded up and deported. The stage was now set for the emergence of an obscure 24-year-old lawyer in the Department of Justice, J. Edgar Hoover. The young and energetic Hoover was placed in charge of the anti-radical campaign. He first surrounded himself with the writings of the Marxist pioneers. His strong convictions about communism were forged then and would serve as his model for the rest of his life. Hoover's first act was the deportation to Russia of 250 aliens accused of attempting to overthrow the United States government. To ensure no chance of a mutiny at sea, the ship also carried 200 soldiers. Hoover predicted that other Soviet arcs would soon set sail. Meanwhile, thousands of other accused radicals were arrested in a national roundup coordinated by Hoover. Some were beaten. Many were imprisoned without benefit of due process. One of those swept up in the raids was a young radical, Ella Wolf. They just put him in jail, you know, and, and the hysteria was incredible. Wherever you went, there was great hysteria. And uh, so... Um, no matter where we uh, organized, there were the Palmer raids. And then two detectives came to take me to the district attorney's office. And when I walked in the first time, he said, first tell me, what does an educated, lovely young girl do with wasting so much time with these dirty, filthy foreigners? That was his first question. And I said, these are not dirty, filthy foreigners. These are friends of mine, and they are comrades. Although thousands were jailed, 
most went free. The accused radicals had violated no laws. The same could not be said for Hoover's Raiders. Very soon, the public became more outraged at the injustices that these detainees were suffering, more than the alleged danger that they posed to the United States. When Attorney General Palmer went on to predict that there would be a revolution on May 1st, 1920, and nothing happened, the Palmer raids ended up looking ridiculous. Hoover nearly lost his job. But Hoover survived the public backlash and in 1924 was named director of the Bureau of Investigation, which later expanded and became the FBI. Hoover would hold this position for almost half a century, serving under six presidents. In those years, the line between legitimate dissent and subversion would often blur. The civil liberties of Americans would be breached time and again. But for millions of Americans, Hoover was the defender of the American way of life. He protected the country against communists and gangsters, and he let the public know it was a carefully orchestrated image. Well, Jack, what do you got to say for yourself? I'm so short, I'll have to get up on the box. All right, Jack, on the box. Let us know what you know about crime, about the conditions in New York. Gee, Mr. Hoover, your demon sure are good. I'd like to be one when I grow up. But if you work hard and play hard and live clean, you'll certainly be one. Thank you. Hoover's public relations savvy was surpassed only by his genius as a government bureaucrat. He established excellent relations with Congress, which approved his requests to build a first-rate crime laboratory. Hoover, who began his career as a Library of Congress messenger, now oversaw the compilation of the most extensive collection of fingerprints in the world. Today's FBI is a monument to its first director. As in the past, the FBI continues to pioneer in the use of science. State-of-the-art technology, like this laser beam examination of faint and very old fingerprints, is one of Hoover's legacies. Today, the Bureau's annual budget is more than a billion and a half dollars. It employs some 17,000 people who serve as the nation's protector in uncovering spies, blocking terrorism, and fighting crime. Taking on the underworld brought Hoover much of his early national attention. In the 20s and 30s, criminals were running wild in the nation, challenging government authority. Hoover declared war on these public enemies, who were taking advantage of the lack of city, state, and federal police cooperation. We must not for a moment lose sight of our goal, to teach the criminal that regardless of his subterfuges, his squirming, his twisting and slimy wriggling, he cannot escape the one inexorable rule of law enforcement. You can't get away with it. Despite Hoover's eventual long reign at the FBI, he had no assurance that he would be reappointed in 1932 when Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president. My father distrusted Mr. Hoover very, very much. Uh, he felt that he was a great administrator and that he had done a good job or he wouldn't have kept him on. Besides the political uncertainty of a new administration, Hoover had an enemy, Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor. My mother disliked Mr. Hoover intensely and uh, disliked Mr. Hoover so to the extent that uh, she would vocally express her displeasure with Mr. Hoover and all of his works. Hoover kept an explosive dossier on Eleanor Roosevelt's private life, one of many such files the FBI director kept on key political figures in Washington. In 1943, the FBI submitted a report to the president suggesting that Eleanor was having an affair. FDR responded with anger. He threatened to send the FBI agents who had filed the allegations to the Pacific, there, they would serve until killed by the Japanese. 
By the time Hoover sent these accusations to FDR, the FBI chief was secure in his job. Roosevelt may not have liked Hoover, but he needed him. In the late 30s, the nation was still at peace, once again isolationist and complacent in mood. But as war clouds gathered in Europe, there was only one man Roosevelt could turn to to provide domestic security against foreign espionage. As to an international intelligence service, none existed. In 1934, Roosevelt gave Hoover the assignment of surveilling potentially subversive groups in the United States, like these American Nazis in Madison Square Garden. The FBI's mission was expanded. Hoover was given responsibility for tracking down German agents throughout the Western Hemisphere, both prior to and during World War II. It was a struggle against enemy agents who had been sent to this country to disrupt our industries, destroy our morale, and damage the impact of our fighting armies. On May 26, 28, 1942, two German submarines left the base at Lorient. One landing on Long Island, the second landed in Florida. Four saboteurs landed from each submarine. They were well equipped with high explosives to create panic and insecurity in this country. The submarine saboteurs were in jail two weeks after they landed. Six of the eight were executed after a military trial. Again, Hoover played up the FBI's successes, but the wartime authority granted for the tracking down of German agents would be used by Hoover to conduct domestic surveillance for the next 36 years. Since Hoover had been directed to find out what groups had been infiltrated or were controlled by communists or fascists, logically, he had to investigate any organization that had a potential for infiltration. In practice, this meant that there was nothing to stop Hoover from investigating any organization to see if it was dominated by communists. If he came up with a negative finding, there was nothing to stop him from investigating the next year or the year after to see if some infiltration had subsequently taken place. But years before Hoover's G-men were hunting down spies, an obscure operative was giving the United States its most important intelligence victories. He was Herbert Yardley, a brilliant pioneer in the secret crafts of code-breaking. Yardley's hobby became a profession in 1912 when he joined the State Department as a code clerk. He quickly showed his genius. One night, bored and with nothing else to do, he broke President Woodrow Wilson's own secret message code. Yardley knew that if he could break America's most important government code, other nations could also. After America's entry into World War I, he was put in charge of an army cryptology unit, MI-8. Yardley demonstrated the military edge to be gained from breaking the enemy's electronic transmissions. MI-8 was dissolved after the armistice. But in the 1920s, Yardley received $100,000 from the government to form a clandestine decoding operation. It operated in absolute secrecy from this townhouse on East 37th Street in New York City. It was called the Black Chamber, and it had one mission, to steal and decipher as many foreign government communications as it possibly could get. One of the great problems that Yardley had was where he was going to get the material, the raw intercepts, the coded messages to solve, because uh, radio was not in great use in those days, and he made an arrangement with a number of the cable companies to surreptitiously feed him these coded messages, which were, as I say, the raw material that he could use to break the codes of uh, Great Britain, France, possibly Germany, uh, many Latin American countries, and so forth. As an emerging global power, the United States now recognized the need for foreign intelligence, and the Black Chamber could provide it quickly, efficiently, and illegally. 
Yardley broke Japan's diplomatic codes in time for the intelligence to be used at an international naval disarmament conference in 1921. By reading Japan's cables, U.S. negotiators knew Japan's secret bargaining position. The Japanese diplomats found the Americans unusually stubborn at the conference table and quickly agreed to a ratio of battleships more favorable to the U.S. Yardley's black chamber would go on to break the codes of many other nations. But in 1929, the entire operation was shut down by Secretary of State Henry L. Stinson, who is said to have uttered, gentlemen do not read each other's mail. Yardley, who had suffered the loss of a finger on his right hand due to experiments with secret inks, was now bitter, out of work, and with a family to feed during the Depression. He wrote a book in 1931 revealing the secrets of the Black Chamber. The Japanese, upon reading the book, discovered their codes had been broken and promptly changed them. The U.S. government never forgave Yardley. Yardley died in 1958 and was buried here in Arlington National Cemetery. His true monument is not this stone, but the largest and most secret agency in the entire U.S. intelligence empire. That is the NSA headquarters, located in a 1,000-acre complex in Fort Meade, Maryland, about 25 miles from downtown Washington. It is highly secured. This is as close as we could get. But in those buildings is America's modern code-breaking effort and other eavesdropping systems as well. Today, the National Security Agency is probably five times the size of the Central Intelligence Agency and probably has about five times the size of the budget. It's an enormously large agency. Uh, at times, it's been upwards of 100,000 people when you count the civilians and the military uh, devoted to signals intelligence and code-breaking. Today, NSA eavesdrops on entire streams of communications. And those streams of communications, which may contain thousands of telephone calls, uh, are simply filtered through a computer that can be programmed with individual telephone numbers to target those numbers and listen to those phone calls. One of the NSA's earliest advisors was William Friedman, a man who took cryptology to new frontiers. Friedman was a genius at code breaking. When the Japanese altered their codes after Yardley's book, it was Friedman who, despite the enormous complexity of Japan's new codes, broke them once again. The highest uh, diplomatic cipher at the time um, was one known as Purple, the Purple Code. And William F. Friedman and his uh, small team, uh, was known as the SIS, the Signals Intelligence Service, were successful in uh, manufacturing or basically putting together almost an identical machine. The Japanese purple machine was a machine that put ordinary messages, sometimes in Japanese, sometimes in English, they sent messages in English, into secret form, so that a message you shall report might come out to be ZQVBLD and so forth. And at the other end, Henry L. Stinson, who is said to have uttered, gentlemen do not read each other's mail. Yardley, who had suffered the loss of a finger on his right hand due to experiments with secret inks, was now bitter, out of work, and with a family to feed during the Depression. He wrote a book in 1931 revealing the secrets of the Black Chamber. The Japanese, upon reading the book, discovered their codes had been broken and promptly changed them. The U.S. government never forgave Yardley. Yardley died in 1958 and was buried here in Arlington National Cemetery. His true monument is not this stone, but the largest and most secret agency in the entire U.S. intelligence empire. That is the NSA headquarters, located in a 1,000-acre complex in Fort Meade, Maryland about 25 miles from downtown Washington. It is highly secured. This is as close as we could get. But in those buildings is America's modern code-breaking effort and other eavesdropping systems as well. Today, the National Security Agency is probably five times the size of the Central Intelligence Agency and probably has about five times the size of the budget. It's an enormously large agency. Uh, at times, it's been upwards of 100,000 people when you count the civilians and the military 
uh, devoted to signals intelligence and code breaking. Today, NSA eavesdrops on entire streams of communications. And those streams of communications, which may contain thousands of telephone calls, uh, are simply filtered through a computer that can be programmed with individual telephone numbers to target those numbers and listen to those phone calls. One of the NSA's earliest advisors was William Friedman, a man who took cryptology to new frontiers. Friedman was a genius at code breaking. When the Japanese altered their codes after Yardley's book, it was Friedman who, despite the enormous complexity of Japan's new codes, broke them once again. The highest uh, diplomatic cipher at the time um, was one known as Purple, the Purple Code. And William F. Friedman and his uh, small team, uh, was known as the SIS, the Signals Intelligence Service, were successful in uh, manufacturing or basically putting together almost an identical machine. The Japanese Purple Machine was a machine that put ordinary messages, sometimes in Japanese, sometimes in English. They sent messages in English into secret form so that a message, you shall report, might come out to be ZQVBLD and so forth. And at the other end, you would have to have a similar machine to take out the ZQVB and so forth and turn it into report. It did this in part by using telephone selector switches such as this. If you see, as this is pressed, a switch goes around. The way this would work in the machine was that if you were constantly pressing the letter A, for example, each time you press it, it would be enciphered into a different letter. At this position, A might be Q. At this position, A might be R. At this position, A might be L. And this constant changing was the principle of the purple machine and you had to reconstruct something like this if you were trying to decipher it and solve it. The purple machine is still considered secret by the NSA and the agency refused our request to film one. Only these rare photographs exist to suggest the immense difficulties faced in recreating a machine Friedman's team had never seen. It was one of the greatest intelligence coups of all time. But its product which could have prevented a profound U.S. military defeat, was squandered. Nineteen forty marked the two thousand six hundredth anniversary of the founding of the Japanese Empire. Emperor Hirohito had chosen the word Showa, enlightened peace, to characterize his reign. But in greeting the new year, Japanese military leaders declared that the time had come for Japan to reject any who stood in the way of the nation. They meant primarily the other major Pacific power. The Japanese had a term for the U.S. presence, Tohayo no Gan, Cancer of the Pacific. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of Japan's combined fleet, began planning a surprise attack on U.S. naval forces at Pearl Harbor. It would be a daring knockdown punch from which the United States would not recover. But the attack had to take place soon. Japan's stockpile of oil would only last about 18 months. While Yamamoto's Navy prepared for the attack, one of Japan's top spies under diplomatic cover in Hawaii began openly gathering intelligence critical to the success of the mission. Takeo Yoshikawa was a Japanese diplomat and a trained spy, and all he had to do was hire a cab and take a sightseeing trip. Yoshikawa took no photographs, he used no binoculars, and he broke no laws. The FBI and military intelligence were helpless to stop him. The hill surrounding Pearl Harbor gave Yoshikawa an excellent view of the disposition and movement of the U.S. fleet. What he freely observed and reported to Tokyo were two significant discoveries concerning schedules. First, the fleet was usually harborside on Sundays. Second, early warning U.S. patrol planes sent to patrol the waters around the islands never left before sunrise. Despite worsening U.S.-Japan tensions, complacency reigned in Honolulu.
The U.S. military was all but asleep, lulled by pronouncements like this. A Japanese attack on Hawaii is the most unlikely thing in the world, with one chance in a million of being successful. That was how the Honolulu Star Bulletin assessed the situation on September 6th, 1941. Two months later, the Japanese Navy was at sea, observing strict radio silence. Meanwhile, Tokyo transmitted false signals to further hide Yamamoto's true position. Captain Alan Cole, a U.S. codebreaker, was stationed at Pearl Harbor. Two or three weeks preceding the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, there was a game of hide-and-seek going on between our electronic surveillance and their electronic transmissions, they trying to convince us that nothing was going on, and we trying to find out what actually was going on. When Admiral Kimmel, who was the commander of the Navy at Pearl Harbor, asked his intelligence officer, uh, Commander Edwin T. Layton, where the Japanese fleet was located, Layton says, I do not know, sir. And Kimmel said, you mean they could be rounding Diamond Head at this moment? And Leighton had to say to him, for all we know, they may. They might, because we do not know where they're located. U.S. naval codebreakers were confused by the false messages being transmitted by the Japanese Navy. They had lost track of the Japanese fleet. And they never received a message that said specifically, we will attack Pearl Harbor. Even so... Three purple intercepts warned of an imminent, hostile Japanese attack somewhere in the Pacific. And any one of them should have galvanized the commanders here. Admiral Husband D. E. Kimmel and General Walter T. Short into action. They did not. They didn't because the commanders never received the intercepts. The codes were diplomatic, not military, and went instead to Washington. Government authorities there failed to transmit this intelligence back to Pearl Harbor. The first intercept asked the Japanese consulate to provide information based on an imaginary grid over Pearl Harbor. This would allow the Japanese Navy pilots to plot the exact position of each individual ship in its specific anchorage. Such intelligence would be of incalculable value in a bombing and torpedo attack. On December 2nd, a second message was intercepted. It ordered Japanese diplomats to burn their codes and destroy their code machines as well. This was a certain sign that the Japanese were planning to launch a major attack. On December 7th, yet another intelligence opportunity was squandered. A final Japanese dispatch, decoded in the early hours of December 7th, revealed that Japan had ordered its diplomats to break off negotiations with the United States at 1 p.m. Such an order for a precise time in the midst of a weekend was a sure sign of imminent attack. There were four hours left to act on the information. But by the time Washington did act, it was too late. The Japanese signal for attack, Tora, 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 had been given. Washington's warning most important intelligence in U.S. history was delivered hours too late by an RCA telegram messenger, Tadeo Fuchikama. And I just delivered as usual to mess the same thing for Chester. And the funny thing is that nobody ever questioned me about my ancestry or anything. No problem. I kind of felt guilty that uh, maybe it was my fault uh, not delivering it quicker. But it wasn't anything I could do because the message came uh, late. of the Pacific Fleet and Air Force was destroyed. Amidst the destruction and confusion, over 1,000 men were wounded. 2,400 more were dead. 
Some 1,100 of those men, sailors, and Marines are entombed under the shrine where the U.S. battleship Arizona rests. It was a terrible price to pay. the Japanese had destroyed most of the Pacific fleet, they had overlooked a critical target that had been ripe for the taking. It proved to be Japan's most serious intelligence blunder of the war, a fact not known until the intelligence debriefing of the Japanese military leaders at the end of the war. I showed them a picture of the oh, one of those great still shots taken from an attacking Japanese plane of Battleship Row. And I said, you gentlemen all know this picture. Oh, yes, 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 they said. I said, do you know what those white circles are up in the top? And they said, sure, fuel tank farm on Oahu. I said, how many bombs did you drop there? They said, no bombs, not a target of attack. And I said, do you realize that all of the fuel oil the United States possessed west of the California coast was located above ground in those tanks? It did not occur to them that oil could be a critical factor to the United States, despite the fact that oil was the critical factor in their own timing of going to war. They had a one year's supply of fuel oil, and uh, of oil in general, petroleum products. And it was that that caused the timing of the outbreak of the war. And yet, thinking of the United States as Bay Coco, the wealthy country, it never occurred to them that we could be short of oil. The fact that America still had its oil would have been little consolation for the stunned and silent crowd that gathered in Times Square, New York, on the night of December 7th, 1941. They wanted to know, as did the entire nation, how such a surprise attack had happened. What had gone wrong? in the Pacific, and who was to blame. General Short was harshly censured and relieved of his command. So was Admiral Kimmel, who at later congressional hearings attempted to defend his actions. We needed one thing, which our own resources could not make available to us. That vital need was the information available in Washington from the intercepted dispatches which told when and where Japan would probably strike. I did not get this information. But another commander in the Pacific, Douglas MacArthur, despite derelictions before and after the attack, escaped criticism. MacArthur, who knew about the attack on Pearl Harbor and was informed of it as soon as it happened, made no movements and there were a number that he could have made in order to ameliorate the Japanese attack eight hours later in the Philippines. Uh, there were those who think he should have attacked Japanese air bases in Formosa. Uh, the very least he could have done was to disperse his planes and uh, he, he did neither of these. And what happened to MacArthur? Nothing. Uh, nothing derogatory, he became a hero. Why wasn't he vilified? Why wasn't he accused as Kimmel was? Because the United States, in addition to needing a scapegoat, also needed a hero. And MacArthur was handy to serve that role. The first wave was landed on schedule and had no opposition. Swell. Couldn't be better. But more than U.S. commanders were at fault. The worst intelligence failure in U.S. history was rooted in the lack of a centralized system to collect and disperse information. The United States government resolved it would never again be subject to surprise attack.
By then, Roosevelt had taken formal steps to change the business of intelligence gathering and spying. This man would play a key role in the shaping of America's Foreign Intelligence Service. William Donovan was the most highly decorated U.S. officer of World War I, where he earned the nickname Wild Bill. He was a very charismatic figure. He wore uniform when I knew him, and he had a lot of merit badges. <laughs> he was, of course, a World War I uh, Congressional Medal of Honor holder. He had piercing bright eyes. Uh, he looked at you intensely when he talked to you. He seemed to be interested in all of his junior staff. Donovan is considered the father of American intelligence, a man still revered by those who once served under him in a hastily invented World War II intelligence group called the Office of Strategic Services. Veterans of the OSS still convene for annual meetings. At this Washington gathering in 1986, the late CIA director, William Casey, made one of his last public appearances and paid tribute to William Donovan. Fellow survivors, OSS started with a vision of Bill Donovan's, a vision that intelligence, subversion, and psychological warfare could be our spearhead, a critical spearhead, in the invasion of Europe. Prior to World War II, there was no foreign intelligence agency for young Americans like Casey to join. Its creation in 1942, however, was not a popular decision. Everything in the government gets decided by committee, and uh, for two years, Donovan was struggling to get an authorization, get a charter, to get uh, uh, allotment of uh, people uh, through committees that there was always somebody there to block them. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover ob objected to anybody uh, being an intelligence uh, other than himself because he felt that he was much better qualified to conduct a worldwide organization because he already had the FBI in place here in this country. The military, of course, were very resentful of the arrival of this independent organization. Now, in various situations, the military intelligence people particularly resisted it. It was borne in upon me by this experience that today in this country, we are facing one of the most crucial tests of our history. Donovan survived the inter-service rivalry and quickly began building his espionage agency. One of the first places Donovan turned to was here, the Library of Congress. Not exactly a haven of spies, but for Donovan's brain trust of scholars, this was a gold mine of critical information about the world now engulfed in war. I think the reason we all admire Donovan was that he was such a dedicated, uh, driving man and that he saw the in brainy side of intelligence. He was not just a spook or a cowboy, though he was fascinated with behind-the-lines operations and he strongly believed in espionage. But he also believed that the product of intelligence could come from anywhere, open sources, library research, whatever, and that what you wanted was a broad contextual understanding of the uh, international conflicts that were confronting the United States so they could be explained in depth to the men like the president who had to make concrete decisions affecting what the United States would do. Before the OSS, American intelligence, what little there was, had been insular. Now, for the first time, America was taking a critical look at the entire world. But such intelligence gathering was only part of the job of the USS. The other part was much more exciting. Like the British service it was modeled after, the USS also conducted espionage and low-level military operations, as seen in these OSS films. Like many others, Richard Helms was trained in the arts of espionage by a British agent. The man who taught close combat was um, Colonel Fairbairn, and I must say that he had a lot of exotic and very effective means of uh, disposing of people. 
his uh, thesis was that in wartime, there are no good, en good guys among the enemy, they're just dead guys. And I must say that it was a most startling experience to learn how many ways that you could find to dispose of your uh, fellow man. Donovan's initial plan was for a group of less than 100 agents. Before the war was over, the OSS grew to over 12,000 as agents trained for missions behind enemy lines. One of its first operations took place in the jungles of Burma, a nation overrun by the Japanese in 1942. Command of Allied Forces was General Joseph Stilwell. We got run out of Burma, and it's humiliating as hell. I think we ought to find out what caused it, go back and retake the place. The retaking of Burma began with a small OSS unit, Detachment 101. Its members parachuted behind enemy lines to undertake a new form of warfare never before fought by Americans. Their mission was to organize and train native tribesmen in guerrilla warfare against the Japanese. OSS headquarters in this area is located... Colonel Carl Eifler, an early OSS recruit, was in charge of the mission. General Stilwell gave us a mission to get into Burma behind the Japanese lines and disrupt communications. Another phase of our mission is to gather intelligence on Japanese movements, equipment, supply, and plans. I uh, took the first unit out of the United States in the history of American warfare to fight behind enemy lines. There was a great deal of, uh, of training went into training the natives themselves. We were looking for individuals that we could train. When we found them, we put them through a school, trained them, physically developed their bodies to where they could take the hardships of, of guerrilla warfare. Without the goodwill of the natives that you are living with and fighting for, guerrilla warfare is useless. We fought a new kind of war that had never been fought before. We always fought attack. We struck and we ran. And the result of our activities was that we drove them back and took from them some 15,000 square miles of territory. I just figured that in my day, I broke every law of God and man. And someday I'd pay an answer to it. Not to man, to God. When I was fighting it, no rules. The only rule was win. These scenes, shot by the OSS, speak of the brutality of a guerrilla war. A war where often the only rule was to win. This left a legacy, one which would come to haunt U.S. covert actions in later years. I know that uh, people take sides and they're rather vociferous on this subject. But the fact remained that in World War II, the OSS was dedicated to the thing that everybody else was, and that was to win the war. And how you won it was irrelevant, and nobody cared. And I served side by side in the OSS with priests and ministers and lawyers and teachers and professors and so forth, all of them dedicated to the same principles. There was no division about uh, how it was desirable to win or how fast we ought to do it, fast as possible. It was only later that these divisions came up and these issues of whether you should have covert action or not have covert action, whether it was moral or immoral, all those things are long after the war was over. By D-Day on June 6, 1944, the OSS had carved out its turf in Allied military operations. 
Many OSS officers and agents were already in place, far beyond the beachhead. There was a can-do attitude of William Donovan that nourished inside the OSS a belief that anything that could be thought of might be done. The assassination of Adolf Hitler was one. The kidnapping of Germany's atomic scientists was another. But on this day, as troops fought for a beachhead at Normandy, OSS paramilitary units working with the French resistance operated behind enemy lines. Blowing up bridges. Disrupting communications. And tying up troops away from the battlefield. But here, as in Burma, were omens of trouble for the United States. The secret arts of commando warfare were learned well. In years to come, they would be used without accountability throughout the world. Those were good OSS operations, and they were the, the cowboy type. And uh, Donovan let it all be known that we had done these things. Uh, I, I think that our successes were real but limited. I do not believe that they succeeded in the uh, clandestine penetration of Germany nearly early enough. I think they did succeed in making contact with behind-the-lines fighters in France and Italy, uh, but they were marginal, if you like, in, in organizing that effort. Uh, I give them high marks for starting from scratch and achieving uh, limited goals. But if you ask, would we have won the war without them, I'd say yes, we would have over a longer period of time. After the Normandy invasion, almost a year of fighting remained in Europe, a time in which the Allies would discover the true horror of Hitler's Third Reich. Many veterans of the OSS would witness such scenes. Here was real evil, evil worth defeating, it seemed, at any cost. By 1945, Germany was conquered and Hitler dead. Russian and American soldiers celebrated. But even then, U.S. leaders, including OSS Commander Donovan, had already begun to regard the Soviet Union with deep suspicion. One totalitarian power was conquered, but another seemed to be taking its place. Quietly, OSS and military intelligence officers began preparing for a new struggle. Surrendering Germans were recruited. Some were scientists and engineers who had created Germany's terror weapon, the V-2. This was the world's first ballistic missile, and Hitler had hurled it against Allied cities with devastating effect. The V-2 appeared too late to change the outcome of the war, but in future conflicts, intelligence officers reasoned, the balance might rest with such a weapon. All of the Allies scrambled at war's end to capture Germany's rocket engineers. America got most of them. They were secretly transported to the United States, where they built America's first missiles. In their ranks were Nazis who had helped run the V-2 missile factory and prison where thousands of slave laborers perished. Others had even more grisly pasts, like General Reinhard Gellin, responsible for the torture and murder of countless Allied prisoners of war, and Klaus Barbie, who personally tortured Jews and French resistance fighters and sent thousands to their deaths. Why were the past deeds of these and others ignored? We asked that question of John Weitz, a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany, who also served in the OSS. And somebody would say, this man knows exactly what's what and who's who. And then somebody else came to them and said, this man is a swine, he's a Nazi. You can't use him. The American officer, nine out of ten times, was a perfectly nice, somewhat middle-aged lieutenant colonel, a reserve officer who wanted to get the heck, the heck back to Oklahoma, to Wisconsin, 
to, to Illinois, to his job, to his family. And he was not anxious to hang around and find somebody else because this was not a pickable man because this was a swine. So he said, okay, I'll use him. Look, you worry about what he's about later. In the meantime, I, I, I'll, I'll get what I want out of him. Then I'm sure we can get rid of him. That's how Klaus Barbie, I, I'm sure, got recruited. While his officers in the field prepared for a new conflict, Donovan lobbied for a permanent intelligence organization. It would confront the Soviets throughout the world. It was a job J. Edgar Hoover sought as well. Donovan promoted his OSS with an old Hoover trick, using the media to build up public support. Quickly, a spate of books, magazine articles, and even comic books appeared, all glorifying the espionage and behind-the-lines missions of Donovan and the OSS. But the media proved part of Donovan's undoing. Someone, many believed it was Hoover, leaked Donovan's confidential proposal to the press. There is a flag-draped coffin. Whatever chances Donovan had to run America's post-war intelligence agency died with the death of Franklin Roosevelt. Within a month of the war's end, Donovan's OSS was disbanded. The OSS commander was given a handshake instead of a permanent intelligence agency. Hoover and his FBI survived, of course, but the director, too, was denied his dream of heading up an expanded intelligence agency. Truman hated Hoover. Truman distrusted Hoover. Therefore, when it came time to set up post-war worldwide intelligence, Truman rejected Hoover's wishes for the FBI to manage both domestic and foreign intelligence. In fact, Truman used the word Gestapo in describing what the FBI would become if it held responsibilities for both domestic and foreign. Therefore, Hoover harbored a grudge against the CIA, and this lasted for the rest of his career. Harry Truman tried to manage a nation that was now the world's greatest economic and military power without an international intelligence agency. He quickly changed his mind. In the uneasy peace that followed World War II, Truman decided there was a need for secret agents and warriors. The OSS would rise again under the name of the Central Intelligence Agency. Many of those who would join the CIA came from the ranks of the OSS, men who witnessed the intelligence disaster of Pearl Harbor and the utter evil of Hitler's Third Reich. But many of these men had learned another lesson as well, one that would leave a disturbing legacy in years to come. The only rule was to win. In just a moment, we'll take you behind the veil of Turkey with columnist Jack Anderson, who reports on life inside that country today. Then at 11 o'clock tonight, it's the second annual report of the Defense Secretary. As Casper Weinberger is joined by the Secretary of Defense of Administration's past, They'll be discussing how our nation's defense policy might be most effectively handled. Edwin Newman is your moderator. And then at midnight tonight, it's French filmmaker Nadine Trintignant's movie, Next Summer, exploring the love relationships of three couples from three different generations. Next Monday's secret intelligence program, the second of this four-part series, is an exploration of the development of the CIA as the president's covert army of intervention develops. It'll be next Monday night at 9 o'clock. Tonight's program will be repeated Sunday afternoon at Secret Intelligence is made possible by public television stations and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. 
Additional funding has been provided by United Airlines, rededicated to giving you the service you deserve. This is a Contra training camp in Honduras, close to the Nicaraguan border. These men are fighting a CIA-supported war against the Sandinista government of Nicaragua. Nicaragua, with its communist government, the argument goes, is a threat to America's national security. So the United States intervened to protect its interests. The argument is not a new one. It's been used by U.S. presidents for over 40 years. There's a saying in Washington, when diplomacy won't work and the Marines are too noisy, the White House turns to the men of the Central Intelligence Agency. We were as interested in finding a country to intervene in their affairs as a young investment banker today is interested in finding out which stock is going to be subject uh, to the next merger takeover. And the reason a lot of people don't like covert actions is that they don't like the means that are used uh, when one gets involved in a thing of this kind. They think it's nasty. They think it's naughty. I think that a bright young man with language skills and uh, a spirit of gung-ho would be very well advised to apply to the Central Intelligence Agency because uh, if he has the kind of life uh, career in it that I did, he'll have uh, all of the thrills and chills and the living experiences that a man could want for a lifetime. This is as physically close as we were allowed to get to the CIA headquarters outside Washington. But during this hour, we'll get much closer. Step by step, we'll see how the Central Intelligence Agency became America's secret army of intervention. received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government. I deem this reply as the unconditional surrender of Japan. Newsmen rush the president's report to a waiting world. And through the early evening, Tuesday, August 14th, the fateful news is flashed. It's official. It's all over. It's total victory. America emerged from World War II, the most powerful nation on Earth. Most U.S. troops returned home to peace and prosperity. But even as the hot war ended, a new war was just beginning. A war fought not with bombs and not by soldiers, but by spies. The first fields of battle would be the devastated cities of Europe. It was here, in cities like Berlin, that the world's secret intelligence empires were born. What happened here was a microcosm of a struggle that was going on throughout the world. There were territories, spheres of influence to be won and lost, protected and exploited. And no one knew that better than Joseph Stalin. At war's end, much of Stalin's large army had not demobilized. His worldwide spy network was equally as formidable. Just a few months after the war ended, the U.S. discovered that crucial atomic secrets had been compromised by an extensive Soviet espionage ring operating throughout the West. Now, under domestic pressure to respond to the Soviets, Truman initiated one of the most far-reaching legislative programs in peacetime history, creating the Marshall Plan, the Defense Department, the NATO Alliance. And in this flurry of legislation, one small section of a bill went almost unnoticed, the legislation that would give the United States a foreign intelligence service, 
the CIA. It was not set up to be run spies. It was not set up to uh, blow up bridges. It was not set up to uh, undermine governments. It was set up to analyze all foreign information coming into the United States government and then presenting that in a finished form to the policymakers of this government. But Truman would soon want more than just information. At the very first meeting of the National Security Council in December 1947, the CIA's role would change to respond to dramatic developments in Europe. Report from red-dominated Prague, February 21st, and the beginning of the four fatal days that ended freedom in Czechoslovakia. Leaving their factories, Czech communist... In Czechoslovakia, the communists used intimidation and assassination to wrest control from a democratically elected government. And now there was a possibility of a communist victory in Western Europe. Italy stands at the crossroads of history as her millions of qualified voters stream to the polls to determine whether she shall remain a free republic or sink silently behind the Iron Curtain in the gray zone where slave nations are governed by Moscow's will. Truman's National Security Council wanted to fight back using the CIA in secret. But did the new agency have the authority to carry out covert operations? The CIA's general counsel, Lawrence Houston, said no. I wrote back an opinion saying that I could find no specific authority in the National Security Act to undertake covert action as opposed to intelligence gathering. That was not the answer the National Security Council wanted. Houston was asked to reconsider and find a loophole in the legislation. He sent me another note saying, are there any further considerations? And I wrote a second opinion saying, if the president gives us the appropriate direct directive, and if Congress gives us the funds to carry out that directive, we can undertake the activity. So that's how we got into it. As simple as that, with the writing of Lawrence Houston's interpretation, the newly created CIA underwent a fundamental change. It had been created by Congress to collect, analyze, and disseminate intelligence, but now, along with those duties, it was already on its way to becoming America's secret army of intervention. For years, headlines have been made of the CIA mining harbors, destabilizing governments, plotting assassinations. The history of these covert operations began with the Italian election campaign in 1948. By today's standards, what the CIA did seems almost innocent. Money was secretly channeled to moderate political groups. Demonstrations and rallies were organized on both sides of the Atlantic. Just how influential the new agency's efforts were is debatable. What mattered to the White House was the result. An anxious world breathes easier as with incomplete returns tabulated, Italy meets communism's challenge with a resounding no. As a result of World War II, the communist writ was running over a whole section of, of Europe and the people that were running the United States in those days, in fact, public opinion was very much against having a communist uh, government come to power in Italy. And the fact that uh, we intruded in the political process in which you might refer to as a legal way uh, was uh, the United States' way of showing that they didn't want this to happen. With the success in Italy, the White House began to undertake covert operations on a global scale, although some of the earliest operations seemed far from serious. I remember years after the, uh, the hot times of the Cold War, the early 50s, discovering in our offices in Austria a whole cache of toilet paper <clears throat> upon each individual piece of which was reprinted a, a portrait of photographic portrait of Maciej Rakosi, the, the bad guy of Hungarian communism up until about 1956. And when we found, we asked, you know, what is this stuff? We found that someone had had the idea that we would put Covertly, of course, the agents, rolls of this toilet paper on the Orient Express as it went through Austria on its way to Budapest, and that Hungarians would have the uh, dubious pleasure of uh, uh, cleaning themselves up after their 
uh, toiletry with uh, with the use of this particular toilet paper. Well, yeah, in retrospect, you have to say this is pretty damn silly. But obviously, someone had thought it was a good idea, and someone in a position to authorize the expenditure of money to produce this stuff had done so. CIA operations were much more serious in June 1950. The communist invasion of South Korea gave the CIA an opportunity to show what they could do. While American soldiers fought on the front lines, CIA officers worked behind the lines, training guerrillas and running foreign agents. These paramilitary operations came naturally to the CIA's new director, former U.S. Army General Walter Beetle Smith. Under Smith's leadership, the size and budget of the agency's covert operations grew dramatically. Between 1949 and 1952, the agency's staff and budget for covert operations increased almost 20-fold. The only place in the world that the CIA's charter prevented them from conducting operations was in the United States, where the Red Scare gripped the nation. Communism. Union Square in New York was the backdrop for these scenes of red violence. From their ranks will come the saboteurs, spies, and subversives, should World War III be forced upon America. Underlining the menace from within... Rooting out espionage agents at home was the responsibility of the FBI. At times, it seemed that communist spies were everywhere, and could be anyone. If a person consistently reads and advocates the views expressed in a communist publication, he may be a communist. If a person defends the activities of communist nations while consistently attacking the domestic and foreign policy of the United States, she may be a communist. If a person does all these things over a period of time, he must be a communist. In 1952, American voters were promised a tougher fight against communism by Republican candidate Dwight Eisenhower. The popular World War II commander vowed to roll back the red tide. The issues in the case are plain, out in the open, for all to see. They are Korea, communism, corruption, and prosperity based on peace. Ike, with his tough stand on communism, easily won office. But the five-star general, who had seen so many thousands of soldiers killed under his command, was determined to prevent the outbreak of large-scale war. To change his combative campaign promises into action, he turned not to the Pentagon, but to the CIA, which was then housed in temporary buildings here along the Washington Mall. For years, the popular view of the Eisenhower era has been one of a complacent president presiding over a do-nothing administration. We now know differently. Eisenhower, more than any other president, left a legacy of international covert operations and intervention. Ike's foreign policies were shaped by Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. Many of those policies were then carried out in secret by his brother, Allen, the new CIA director. John Foster Dulles believed that the world was a struggle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And therefore, no one could be impartial. If he's not on our side, he can't be impartial. That's ridiculous. No one can be impartial, by definition. Uh, therefore, he must really be secretly in league with the Soviet Union and the world communist movement. Soon the attention of the Dulles brothers was drawn to a troublesome Middle Eastern country. What they did there would have a long-lasting repercussion. When demonstrations like these began in Iran in 1979, Americans were stunned to see such outpourings of anti-American outrage. But Iranian hatred of the U.S. did not evolve overnight. It reaches back over 35 years and can be traced to a British-American secret operation codenamed Ajax. In 1951, Iran's Prime Minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, nationalized his country's oil fields. 
The British, who had controlled and profited from Iran's oil, decided to act. They found an ally in the United States, which was fearful of Mossadegh's independence and friendly overtures to the Soviet Union. Together, Britain and the United States conspired to overthrow Mossadegh and replace him in power with the young figurehead of the Iranian government, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. What the world was told about events in Iran went like this. Former Premier Mossadegh's ruined house is a mute testimony to three days of bloody rioting culminating in a military coup from which the one-time dictator of Iran fled for his life. In the quick shift of power, Mossadegh was finally apprehended and awaits trial for treason. Iranian oil may again flow westward. What newsreel audiences of 1953 did not see was this man, Kermit Roosevelt, the grandson of Theodore Roosevelt, and CIA undercover officer. In 1952, uh, I went to examine the situation and see what might be done, and then came back and waited until the, the Republicans had come into office before proposing it to the State Department, because I knew that they wanted the plan. It was the first coup d'etat that the agency had ever been involved in, and, and the agency thought that it was possible based upon my reports. <laughs> Roosevelt's plan for overthrowing the government was simple. Like a master parade marshal, Kermit financed mass mob demonstrations against Mossadegh. Agents were very effective. They had promised that they could produce a mob to go against Mossadegh, and they did. And that mob, mob uh, marched on Mossadegh's residence uh, and forced him to flee. The Shah, in exile during the unrest, returned to claim his throne. America and Britain divided equally 80% of profits from the oil fields. The Eisenhower White House was delighted, but Kermit Roosevelt was uneasy. In fact, I warned the, the group that assembled in the White House to debrief me after the operation. I said, don't make the mistake of believing that this can be done any time you want to do it. The situation has to be exactly right. You've got to have the people on your side and hopefully the army too. But Roosevelt's success in Iran made the White House anxious to use the CIA's new power to solve other international problems. Uh, Foster Dulles uh, had the theory that anything we wanted to do, if we wanted to do it enough, we could do it. And that was just all wrong, in my opinion. Roosevelt was asked to take charge of a second coup operation. He declined the offer. The CIA went ahead. This is Guatemala, 1950. And this is how America was used to thinking about Guatemala and most of Latin America. A banana republic of hard-working peasants, happily harvesting abundant crops. The harvest went to Guatemala's largest landowner, the American-owned United Fruit Company. But that profitable arrangement was threatened in 1951 when this man, Jacobo Arbenz, became Guatemala's second democratically elected president. At the White House, Arbenz and his wife Maria were under suspicion for their associations with left-wing and communist parties. He was regarded, I think, with pretty solid evidence as a strongly leftward-leaning president who was dependent or had become dependent on the communist party and communist controlled organizations for his survival and who therefore was giving them and could be expected to give them a steadily larger role in running the country. Like Mossadegh in Iran, Arbenz tried to nationalize his country's greatest economic asset, in this case, the plantations of United Fruit, which turned to Washington for help. Several of United Fruit's former associates and future employees held influential positions in the Eisenhower administration. The role of United Fruit uh, in the Guatemala operation is uh, uh, 
it's a uh, it's a significant one. Let me put it that way. There, uh, I had been in, uh, in in an adjacent country, sending back reports uh, to Washington on uh, the increasing level of communist influence in uh, in Guatemala. In fact, I had gone up and made a presentation to the then director about the grave situation that was developing in Guatemala, and nothing happened. About a year later, as I recall it, uh, Tommy Corcoran, who was the lawyer and lobbyist for United Fruit, uh, made his pitch to the then director of CIA, and things got moving. Soon, a coordinated White House campaign against Arbenz was underway. influence is very strong has come into a position to dominate militarily the Central American area. Already, the Guatemalan government has made gestures against its neighbors, which they deem to be threatening, and which have led them to appeal for aid. So Arbenz, when he decided, listen, Guatemala is going to be for Guatemalans. And that is why he was overthrown, not because he was a communist. Former Marine Philip Rettinger was a CIA officer assigned to the Guatemala operation. Uh, when I was there, they knew that uh, they couldn't convince Eisenhower to overthrow the government just because of the United Fruit Company. So they said he was a communist. And Eisenhower was a de dedicated anti-communist. So he said, OK, the word is go. The agency's plan for Guatemala? Select a new leader acceptable to Washington. Devise a strategy of psychological warfare. Back it up with a small rebel army and air force. Then, invade. And we went to Tegucigalpa and set up our little office there, our little safe house, to train a group of Guatemalan exiles uh, who were discontented with uh, their lot in Guatemala and had left Guatemala and gone to Honduras. And I had a sneaking idea at that time that this little army we had was certainly not going to be the key to the whole thing. There must be something else going on, which of course I found out later. We also had there in Tegucigalpa our candidate, our picked candidate for the new president of Guatemala. And when I first met this little guy, I, I, was, I was staggered. I said, you mean to tell me that we're going to make this little fox-faced guy, nervous little fellow, president of Guatemala? The CIA's choice to run Guatemala was Castillo Armas. Three years earlier, Armas had unsuccessfully attempted to overthrow the Guatemalan government. Now, with the CIA's backing, he was ready to try again. And off they went, and we sent these guys in to, uh, to uh, Guatemala, and they ran into a, a Guatemalan army patrol and quit right on the spot. With the rebel forces stalled on the border, the coup was in danger of collapsing. It was then that the CIA turned to Eisenhower for additional air support. What was President Eisenhower's reaction? Well, he was, he had, of course, authorized the operation at a crucial point when uh, we needed three or four, I think it was four more aircraft. He personally authorized their movement uh, to Guatemala against the recommendation at that time of the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs. We had, had three old U.S. fighter planes, two P-47s and a P-38. They had American pilots, uh, which was not supposed to be revealed, of course. And they flew up to Guatemala City and strafed the, uh, the uh, military uh, parade ground and dropped leaflets and dropped a few bombs. I don't think they ever hurt anybody, frankly. But they sure scared a bunch of people and, and gave the impression that there was a military attack against the government of Guatemala, which, of course, there was not. Crucial to the success of the CIA engineered attack was propaganda. Signs appeared threatening death to the supporters of Arbenz, while CIA officers beamed deceptive radio reports of war and upheaval throughout the country. El Movimiento Libertador, comandado por el Coronel Carlos Castillo Armas, Solo tiene un grande, un histórico compromiso que cumplir. Servir a la patria y luchar por ella para mantener vigentes los derechos In, in uh, the overthrow of Arbenz, uh, my principal job was chief of the propaganda task force. 
That is to say, creating the uh, uh, radio broadcasts, uh, the leaflets uh, that were dropped into the city, uh, uh, creating with uh, Dave Phillips uh, the climate of fear and apprehension that preceded the actual small-scale invasion that was run by uh, Colonel uh, Castillo Armas. In the beginning, at least, all propagandists know Mr. Goebbels' rule. If you're going to tell any big lies, wait till the time comes. In the beginning, this radio station gained credibility. It never broadcast things that were untrue. It would say, for instance, we cannot confirm the report that there has been a battle at Esquipulas and 5,000 people are dead. We have no facts one way or another. But of course, the word then spread, there must have been a tremendous battle. The radio would say to Commander X, please send us 500 soldiers. Commander X would reply, I cannot send you 500 soldiers. All I can spare is 300 soldiers. In fact, there was no Commander X, and there weren't even three soldiers. Isolated in the National Palace and shaken by the CIA campaign against him, Arbenz, the legally elected president of Guatemala, resigned and fled the country. Castillo Armaz was flown by the CIA to Guatemala City to replace the remnants of the Arbenz government. Carlos Castillo Armas now speaks of the future. The aim of his government will be to restore the civil rights of the people, to establish a true democracy based on the principles of his movement of national liberation, truth, justice, and honest labor. And Eisenhower was absolutely elated. But there was a question of a president saying, I want something done. It was done, and he was pleased as punch. As he put it in my presence, he said he thought it was just dandy. It was a new weapon for him, wasn't it? It was so obviously an easy way to do things. There was no public account accounting. Uh, either of the action or the funds needed for it. It was, too, a way to avoid asking the opinion of the public as to whether it should be done or not. It was the easy course. But in the long run, there was a bloodbath. A succession of military governments that began with Castillo Armas has given Guatemala one of the worst records of human rights in the Western Hemisphere. In the last 30 years, 150,000 people have been killed. Another 40,000 have disappeared without a trace. But I do know that as a result of his overthrow, there have been a series of repressive military dictatorships that have caused the death of over 100,000 Guatemalans. And that is on our collective conscience. I will tell you that right now, because I know that that would not have happened. On balance. I think that we should not intervene in the affairs of any country overseas where there has been a democratically elected government. And that was the case in Guatemala. So on balance, if I had to choose today, thinking the way I think today, I would probably say we shouldn't have done it. However, Joseph Stalin was still alive when someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you like to get into this business? The Cold War was a very serious thing indeed. There was no question about who had the white hat and who had the black hat. In the 1950s, men like Phillips still dreamed of rolling back the Iron Curtain. They saw a chance when masses of Hungarians revolted in October 1956. This was just the kind of anti-Soviet uprising the CIA had been encouraging in Eastern Europe for years. This is Hungary calling. This is Hungary calling. We are requesting you to send us immediate aid for the sake of God and freedom help Hungary. But Eisenhower refused to help. Supporting the revolt might have meant war with the Soviets. The message for the rest of Eastern Europe was clear. The United States might encourage revolt, but do little else. 
The CIA's activities were not so limited elsewhere. The agency expanded its operations throughout Latin America, Africa, and especially the Far East. When I joined the Far East Division, I found that we had a plan for every country. The plans that we had were very like military plans. I mean, they had, we had courses of action, and we had specific uh, propaganda themes that were going to play for specific audiences. And it was a feeling, I think, that uh, the communists were coming, and we had to stop them wherever they may show their ugly heads. The newly emerging nations of the post-war world were targets of opportunity for both the U.S. and the USSR. Leaders of these new independent nations, like Sukarno of Indonesia, were invited to Washington and encouraged to ally themselves with the West in the global superpower struggle. But behind the scenes, secret intelligence officers were plotting less diplomatic methods of gaining Sukarno's support. He had a lifelong ambition to sleep with Marilyn Monroe. So considerable thought was given. And as far as I know, even an attempt was made to arrange for this. Uh, we would have then had Sukarno under our control. Of course, this never came off. Despite Washington's attempts, Sukarno, as a leader of the newly emerging Third World, chose to remain non-aligned. Now, this, Mr. Dulles, could not stand. And so, we were given the mandate uh, to, as it was sort of picturesquely put, hold Sukarno's feet to the fire. We, we thought we could make a film that would show the Indonesians and the world that he was dominated by a Soviet spy. So we produced a, porn a, a pornographic film using a film from the Los Angeles Police, police Department. Um, we had to get a mask to uh, cover uh, the male uh, actor because we couldn't find an actor who looked like Sukarno. And um, we also tried to fix up the blonde to look as good as we could. The CIA's experiment in pornographic film production seemed to have little effect. What the agency did in the Philippines was much more successful. Using a combination of political, psychological, and military methods, they ensured the election of Democratic leader Ramon Magsaysay. We went in there with the military uh, advisors who were sent in to help. We also developed uh, techniques of psychological warfare, flying airplanes uh, over the villages uh, with mysterious voices. Um, these techniques that subsequently became known as winning the hearts and minds of the people um, were a major part of uh, the program, and they were successful. The new president-elect of the Philippine Republic, Ramon Magsaysay, seen here as he conducted his strenuous campaign for the nation's highest office. The 46-year-old former Minister of Defense and ardent anti-communist led his Nationalista Democratic Party to victory over his Liberal Party rival, President Alpidio Quirino. In some sections... So Mike Saisai was elected and began a program of, really, of social revolution. I feel it was one time when the agency was on the side of the angels. Not only did CIA officers have a plan for every country, but a secret White House report issued in 1954 encouraged them to explore every possible scientific and technical approach to the intelligence problem. Whatever they could imagine, they tried. The agency started a drug program to study the feasibility of mind control. Here in Berlin, the CIA, with the assistance of the British, built what was supposed to be a huge radar facility. Actually, it hid the construction of a secret tunnel that reached several hundred yards underneath the border, where they placed a massive telephone tap on Soviet communications routed through East Berlin. 
just getting rid of the dirt was impressive. The tap lasted 11 months before it was discovered. The Soviets filled in the tunnel. The Americans tore down the facility. And all that's left is the dirt. From deep inside the Earth to high up in the stratosphere, the presidential report encouraged new ways of peering into the Soviet Union. For aerial surveillance, the CIA developed the remarkable U-2 spy plane that penetrated Soviet airspace and brought back a bonanza of intelligence information on their military activities. However, there was a more disturbing message in another part of that same report. The U.S., it said, faced an implacable enemy whose avowed objective is world domination. There are no rules in such a game. Acceptable norms of human conduct do not apply. In the last year of Eisenhower's presidency, the new norms of conduct included assassination plots against foreign leaders. The first target was this man, Patrice Lumumba of the Congo. In that turbulent region of Africa, he was feared as a potential pawn for Soviet interests. He was killed by domestic enemies before CIA agents reached him. Other political targets during this period were Rafael Trujillo of the Dominican Republic and Colonel Abdul Qasem of Iraq. They too would be killed, again, at the hands of their own countrymen. This man was the CIA's main target. Yet Fidel Castro grew only stronger after CIA attacks against him. Havana is as scenic today as it was 30 years ago, when it was a favorite American resort for vacationing and gambling. But today, the capital, like all of Cuba, is filled with reminders of the bitter U.S. campaign waged against this Caribbean island. American economic trade was cut off in 1960. Signs of that embargo, like frozen time capsules, still ramble through Havana's Plaza of the Revolution. Throughout the city, billboards exhort the Cuban people to defend their country. The enemy, of course, is Uncle Sam. This is a museum like no other in the world. On exhibit are abandoned CIA military hardware, like this American-made tank. In the nearby jungle, twisted remains of a downed CIA plane can be found, mute testimony to this once secret struggle. This was a war most Americans have forgotten, but not even the youngest Cuban is allowed to forget. A war that began soon after Castro came to power in 1959. One of Castro's first acts was to have communism declared a legal political party. He canceled elections. His economic minister, Che Guevara, nationalized American businesses. And Castro began to form an alliance with the Soviet Union. If communism were intolerable in Iran, Guatemala, and the Congo, a Marxist government only 90 miles from America's shores was unthinkable in Washington. Fidel Castro would have to go. There is a limit to what the United States and self-respect can endure. That limit has now been reached. The break in relations was only the public side of the war against Castro. It is my hope and my... In secret, the CIA was preparing other, more serious options. But I had been asked after a trip to Cuba to draw up a list of uh, things to do, as it were, a shopping list. And the last one uh, was uh, to get rid of the, the leader, that is, to, to have Castro assassinated by Cuban patriots. That was the qualifier that I had on there. Richard Bissell was in charge of the CIA's anti-Castro programs. Did President Eisenhower know of the CIA planned assassination attempts on Castro? That's a matter of controversy. It is my belief that he did. I'm sure he didn't know about any of the details. I'm sure he didn't want to. I, I, I very much doubt if at any time he had expressed acquiescence in uh, a nakedly labeled assassination effort. But what he may very well have done in this case, as he 
is documented as having done in another example is to say I, I, I want that man got rid of and in effect any means are legitimate. Besides assassination plots, Bissell became the architect of an invasion plan, similar to the one used in Guatemala. This plan called for the recruitment of Cubans who had fled to southern Florida after Castro's rise to power. This is Brigade 2506, a group of Cuban Americans training outside Miami. Three decades after Castro's rise to power, they still train in hopes of recapturing their homeland, a place that many in this group now only know from their parents' and grandparents' stories. In March 1960, Eisenhower gave the CIA permission to begin training this brigade. Among the original members of this unit was 17-year-old Raul Masvidal. The CIA had an office in, in what's today uh, Little Havana. Uh, and it was a small, uh, very inconspicuous office. Uh, and you went in there, gave your name, uh, and, they, and then you will give them a phone number, and, and a few weeks later you will hear from them, and they will say, uh, you're ready to uh, depart, they will say for where. In the middle of the night, we were loaded into planes and traveled for hours. Where Masvidal and the others landed was at this secret CIA training facility in northern Guatemala. I don't think anybody had a doubt that uh, we were going to succeed, that we were going to get the help that we were promised. Max Cruz was another young Cuban exile who had signed up with the brigade. And there was a complete blind trust in, in the United States that you could not, uh, you know, by no way think that something was going to fail. While the exiles trained in the Guatemalan highlands, a young Democrat named John Kennedy was running for president. His campaign was based on charges of Republican inactivity in the face of communist advances. It had an ironic similarity to Eisenhower's own campaign eight years earlier. I want the people of the world and Mr. Khrushchev to know that a new generation of Americans has taken leadership of this country and that this free society speaks with power, force, and decision. After winning the election, Kennedy would find out just how wrong he was. As president, he inherited Eisenhower's Cuban invasion plan, a plan that was growing larger and less secret every day. The entire idea was the following. A section of Cuban territory had to be secured by indigenous Cuban forces, the invasion brigade, whereupon the provisional Cuban government, with myself as the U.S. representative, were to fly there from Miami and land on that cleared strip, whereupon the Cuban representatives would declare themselves a government in arms, and our fleet lying offshore under Admiral Burke would then come in with the aircraft and the Marines. I think we had 15,000 Marines waiting offshore. This operation, which I had understood to be a typical guerrilla warfare, psychological warfare type operation, involving men who carried their own weapons, was suddenly changed into a military operation, which called for the landing of a brigade of 1,400 troops and a platoon of tanks. Now, there's a maxim in the intelligence business that you can't hide a hippopotamus with a handkerchief. You certainly can't cover a tank on a Caribbean beach with one. Well, I was very skeptical. I've never uh, fully stated what my own attitude was at that time. But um, I think I badly served President Kennedy uh, during that affair by not pressing him to ask a question which was not asked. He should have turned to our Joint Chiefs of Staff at one stage and said to them, now, gentlemen, I may want you to do this with American forces. And they would have come in with a plan for a sustained preliminary bombing of Cuba 
a landing of not less than two divisions in the first wave, backed up by the Navy and Air Force and Army, Marines. And it would have been apparent to President Kennedy that, that the bill presented by our Joint Chiefs of Staff meant that uh, this puny little brigade in, in Central America didn't have a chance. Within three months of his inauguration, Kennedy was forced to make one of the most difficult decisions of his presidency. Instinctively, he distrusted the invasion plan, but he had promised during the campaign to do something about Castro. He also worried over the political costs of abandoning the exiles, a concern reinforced by the CIA. But Dulles did not specifically say, but it imply was, was that this would also have political repercussions in the United States, where the abandonment of the plan would cause, give ammunition to the Republicans, and everyone would say, what does Kennedy, Lieutenant J.G. during the war know about um, these great matters, and if Eisenhower backed the plan, it, it was a good, great plan. And that made it, that made cancellation difficult. The Cuban exile elements had been persuaded to take a particular stand, to act in certain ways, by the Eisenhower administration who had made certain commitments to them. We told uh, the Kennedy White House very clearly, this group is in being now. They've been down here for like six months in the goddamn jungle and they're trained to the teeth. So the proposition was put to Kennedy, use it or lose it. Kennedy decided that canceling the invasion was riskier than going ahead with it. So he opted for action. But he was obsessed with maintaining plausible deniability that there be no proof of any U.S. involvement. Key to the invasion's success was a surprise air attack to destroy Castro's small air force. Key to maintaining plausible deniability was a disinformation plan to convince the American press and public that this airstrike originated from inside Cuba, flown by defecting pilots from Castro's Air Force. The assault has begun on the dictatorship of Fidel Castro. Cuban army pilots open the first phase of organized revolt with bombing raids on three military bases. Two of the B-26 light bombers then seek asylum in Florida. On the heels of Only the part of this story was true. There was an airstrike in Cuba, but it was the work of CIA exiles, not defecting Cuban pilots. This propaganda campaign began to unravel almost immediately when questioned by suspicious newsmen. An even more serious problem was that the surprise air attack, reduced in size by Kennedy, had not destroyed all of Castro's air force. The decision of the president, which he communicated to me at the end of a meeting, in a rather offhand manner, was that we could not make the first strike at full strength. Uh, I, I guess about half of it was destroyed, but unfortunately half wasn't, and that's what did the damage. No one in Washington anticipated the reaction that the surprise airstrike would have on the Cuban people. It was their Pearl Harbor, an act of war committed without warning that united the Cuban people behind Castro. Uh, I think the presentation we received from the CIA was an incomplete presentation. We were given the impression in the White House uh, that uh, if the, uh, that the invasion would set off uh, the defections from the Cuban militia and uprisings behind the line, and that even if it failed, the people, the invaders could melt away into the hills and so on. And none of those things were true. Fidel publicly ridiculed the CIA disinformation plot that the bombing had been done by his own pilots. Not even Hollywood, he said, would make up such a story. Any hopes of an internal uprising against Castro were gone. And then, of course, the final blow fell when on Sunday afternoon, with the troops virtually going ashore, the what was to have been originally the third strike and we had counted on as one at full strength, was also scrubbed. Kennedy was backing away, but no one told that to Brigade 2506. The CIA, with the help of the U.S. Navy, would deliver the men to these shores. After that, they were on their own. Initially, in the beach, there was not 
tremendous opposition. There was very, very light opposition. As the day went on, we were having more and more, the, the more, more forces were coming into us and, and, uh, and we were fighting uh, you know, to no end. Our Air Force kept uh, being shut down and uh, the Air Force was traveling freely through the sky, so I thought wondering what the heck is going on. The CIA promised the brigade the skies will be yours. Instead, they belong to Castro. Within hours, his planes had sunk two supply ships loaded with ammo, fuel, and men. The remaining supply ships steamed out of the bay to safety leaving over 1,000 Cuban invaders stranded. When we knew that our troops had landed, when uh, we started hearing things over the radio that uh, one of our ships had been sunk, that uh, some of our troops were running into trouble, uh, there seemed to be a lot of confusion as to why we didn't let us in. Uh, I remember that uh, some of the people in my ship started to worry about, hey, fellows, you know, we were brought in here just for the parade in Havana and uh, we're not going to be part of this whole thing after you know, spending so, so much time in training. Mas Vidal and the others did not yet know how desperate the situation was. There was no melting into the mountains. The landing site was surrounded by swamp instead of hills. And the one road into the area was full of Castro's troops, led by his close lieutenant, Ramon Jose Fernandez. Eh, Fidel, con un gran entusiasmo, nos dijo que con el aseguramiento de ese punto, ganábamos la guerra, que ya habíamos ganado la guerra. Y a continuación pasó a explicarnos cómo se habían hundido algunos barcos enemigos y cómo también se habían derribado aviones enemigos. In desperation, American CIA instructors flew missions themselves. Four of them were shot down and killed. Meanwhile, on Raúl Masvidal's ship, still at sea, a mutiny threatened to break out. When we found out that the invasion had failed and that our troops had been basically killed or taken prisoners, one of the theories was that uh, the CIA didn't want any witnesses. And uh, here we were, we were dressed in camouflage. We had most of the communications equipment, and we had weapons. Uh, of course, we had a lot of ammunition. And we started discussing possibilities of taking over the ship and then uh, heading somewhere. The exile soldiers on shore had no such option. Over 100 had been killed. The rest, including Max Cruz, had surrendered. I was taken prisoner. I was moved to a house in the same beach where we were. I got there. I said, well, there's no way to get alive from here. I better get ready to die. And I to prepare myself. And I think it's when you have uh, a big brother that is telling you, come on, fight, I'm here, I will defend you, things get bad. And uh, you say, okay, brother, and you get in, big, get in the biggest fight that you can ever think of because your big brother's there. If I need him, he's gonna be there. And after I've been bit to death, you know, he turned around and said, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. In Washington, the CIA's stunned planning group, men whose operations had succeeded in Italy, Iran, and Guatemala, listened via radio as the disaster unfolded. To Pepe San Roman's uh, last broadcast to us, uh, he was hip deep in water uh, with a walkie-talkie communicating with a relay point uh, and Admiral Burke's task force offshore. And uh, he cursed us and uh, many of us uh, burst into tears. Uh, I, it was one of the most tragic events uh, in my life. Uh, I couldn't believe that uh, our government would permit uh, a massacre like that to take place. It was devastating. During those moments when that military commander was broadcasting from the shallows at the beach, there was one of the officers in the room who scratched his wrists so nervously they started bleeding profusely. Another officer, a man who had been the commander of a tank battalion, during World War II, vomited in a waste paper basket. 
And then it was over. And I got drunk. Drunk with fatigue and drunk with remorse. In human terms, more than a 1,000 exiles spent nearly two years in prison. Over 250 Cubans, fighting on both sides, died. But there were other costs. The United States suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of a small, developing country. America trained, equipped, and landed exiled soldiers on these shores, and then simply left them. The White House, through the CIA, tried to keep this act of war a secret and plausibly deniable, but deniable to whom? Not to Cuba, but to the people of the United States. It's easy to see now that this once bloody beach was a warning of the limits of secrecy and intervention for a democracy. But those lessons were not to be learned until another third world country, Vietnam. Secret intelligence was made possible by public television stations and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding has been provided by United Airlines, rededicated to giving you the service you deserve. Schools, colleges, public libraries, and other organizations may purchase video cassettes of this series by calling 1-800-424-7963. The companion book to this series, Secret Intelligence, is available in bookstores or through this toll-free number. To order, call 1-800-441-3000. The hardbound volume is $19.95 plus handling. And please, have your credit card ready.
Secret Intelligence is made possible by public television stations and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding has been provided by United Airlines, rededicated to giving you the service you deserve. By the early 60s, the U.S. presidency had at its command secret and powerful agencies of government, the CIA, the FBI, and the National Security Agency. But in service to the White House, these same secret agencies were engaged in activities that were sometimes illegal and sometimes directed against innocent American citizens. As we shall see, these activities, many of them undertaken for years, were uncovered following the national traumas of Vietnam and Watergate, a time when America's secret agencies found themselves caught in a bitter power struggle between Congress and the White House. To survive, the agents of secret intelligence, so long the private arm of the president, would learn to say no. In 1961, few Americans suspected that a U.S. espionage empire existed. That began to change on this desolate beach. In April of that year, a CIA-trained brigade of Cuban exiles seeking to overthrow the communist government of Fidel Castro met disaster at Cuba's Bay of Pigs. Over 100 of America's proxy soldiers were killed. More than a thousand were captives of Castro. It was a humiliating defeat for the CIA. It sounds like that I blame President Kennedy for the failure of the Bay of Pigs. Indeed, I do. Equally guilty, I think were those of us at CIA who didn't at some point say, hey, wait a minute. You're expecting this secret operation to perform what armies are supposed to perform. Somewhere along the line, we should have had the wisdom to say no. But the CIA had not yet learned that lesson. Neither had America's new president. John Kennedy had come to office reluctant to approve the Bay of Pigs invasion. But only weeks after the fiasco, he was urging a new campaign against communism. We dare not fail to grasp the new concepts, the new tools, the new sense of urgency we will need to combat it, whether in Cuba or South Vietnam. Kennedy's new concepts and tools included covert action. Secretly, he placed his brother Robert, America's Attorney General, in charge of a new CIA campaign against Castro. Bobby Kennedy was very hands-on in this period. You're absolutely correct that after the uh, Bay of Pigs era, he wanted to uh, do something about that. And he was very forthright about it and very earnest about it. There isn't any question of it out. This is a legacy of Kennedy's demand for covert action against Cuba, a present-day military training site on the outskirts of Miami. The CIA has no known connection to these men, but the Cuban-Americans who train here maintain the Kennedy's obsession of one day toppling Cuba's communist regime. In 1962, some of these men took part in Operation Mongoose, a CIA program to remove Castro from power. Mongoose was an operation that Bobby Kennedy proclaimed the top priority of the U.S. government. At the time, it was the CIA's largest covert mission anywhere in the world, and it was centered in the one place the CIA was not authorized to act. 
inside the United States. Operating as if it were on foreign soil, Mongoose infiltrated South Florida neighborhoods. Supporting Operation Mongoose were dozens of front organizations, safe houses, and Cuban agents. One of them was Eugenio Martinez. Today, he sells cars in the Miami area. In the early 60s, he ran this CIA boat from South Florida waterways to Cuba. The CIA acknowledged uh, 354 missions carry on by me. We attack uh, military bases of the Russian in Cuba, and I can tell you that's successful, and a few other operations. Martinez's cargo was explosives, weapons, and commando raiders. His task was to slip them past Cuban patrol boats like this one. The explosives and the men who would use them made the 90-mile trip here to Cuba in small boats, slipping quietly ashore at night. The targets were for the taking. Power transformers, bridges, communications towers, sugar refineries, all part of Bobby Kennedy's pressure on the CIA to cripple Cuba's economy. Today, the U.S. maintains a 30-year-old trade embargo against Cuba. But in the early 60s, Operation Mongoose aimed at inciting an anti-Castro revolution here. Mongoose raiders blacked out cities. They attacked shipping, and they used chemicals to contaminate Cuba's sugar production. A variety of things were done. And Bobby Kennedy was sort of in charge of the whole thing. I mean, he was the one that had the whip in hand and was trying to get something done about this. Was, what are you doing to get rid of those fellows? What are you doing to blow up this? What are you doing about that? Uh, how many fellows have you got ready to co cause a landing and blow up that refinery and so forth? Raids were only one part of Operation Mongoose. In an off-the-record meeting with Kennedy, New York Times reporter Tad Schultz learned that a more sinister component to the operation was being considered. I sat down in Safa and he sat on the rocket chair and he said, what would you say if I uh, had ordered, if I would order Fidel Castro's assassination? And, you know, I was kind of taken aback. It's not your everyday question. And I said, I believe, uh, almost verbatim, uh, Mr. President, I think it would be an appalling idea because as a, as a citizen, I do not believe the United States should be in the business of assassination. And uh, he sort of smiled and he said, well, I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, I feel the same way, but I have been or I am under a great deal of pressure uh, to authorize such an operation. I take a dim view and I'm glad to see that at least someone agrees with me. And to which I said, thank you very much, because there isn't very much else that you can say at the end of a conversation like this, except to wonder, did it really happen? And... Methods for assassinating Castro already existed. This is Fort Detrick, Maryland. This once secret facility was home to CIA experiments with drugs like LSD. It was also an armory for the agency's executive action capability a program begun under the Eisenhower administration for disposing of unwanted foreign leaders. Some of the plots called for lethal poisons that were manufactured here. Dr. Everett Hennel, a microbiologist at Fort Detrick for three decades, worked in association with the CIA. These are what we call class three cabinet systems. They're gas tight systems for working with almost complete safety with any infectious diseases, toxins, things such as the shellfish toxin, they're very toxic indeed, particularly when highly purified. And uh, I understand that these could be placed on steel needles and fired with air guns uh, into an animal and induce death almost uh, immediately. So that they were apparently a very effective or could be a very effective uh, type of uh, covert weapon. But the real targets of these deadly drugs were not animals, but foreign leaders, like 
Fidel Castro. One scheme called for contaminating his cigars. Another suggested spraying his television studio with LSD during one of his frequent speeches. To administer its drugs and poisons, the CIA hired the Mafia, which had been kicked out of Cuba. Prior to the Cuban Revolution, Havana had been a gambling haven run by organized crime. Castro had shut the casinos down. The CIA believed that the Mafia wanted Castro dead. Mobsters John Rosselli and Sam Giancana were hired by the CIA as hitmen. It was under the Eisenhower administration that members of the mob, Sam Giancana and Rosselli, were recruited by the CIA. It seems incredible. But they were recruited by the CIA in 1960, established in Miami hotels. I think they conned the CIA. I don't think they did a damn thing. They took a certain amount of money off the CIA. The Mafia assassins reappeared as part of the CIA's Operation Mongoose. We did not know about the CIA assassination plots. All intelligence agencies uh, cherished long enough, protected long enough, uh, saved from oversight long enough, begin to take uh, the law into their own hands. People who spend all the world in the, uh, all their life in this hallucinatory world come to feel that they know the requirements of national security better than transient elected officials. But the CIA had no doubt that it was simply saying yes to White House orders, explicit or not. The issue about Castro and the Kennedys was simple enough. President Kennedy wanted to get rid of Fidel Castro, and he wanted to get rid of him if, in any way that we could find to get rid of him. I think it's a simple statement. John Kennedy may not have known of the assassination plots, but his brother did. The CIA told Bobby Kennedy about its mafia assassination team, but only after Bobby, America's attorney general, had tried to prosecute the mafia men for racketeering. And he was extremely annoyed, but what he was really annoyed about was his interference with his prosecution of these mafia types. He never, uh, had never said anything uh, to me really one way or the other about the uh, assassination operation. Bobby Kennedy and the White House had no comment on the CIA's assassination plots. Neither did Congress. Formal congressional oversight of intelligence did not exist then, and there seemed to be no demand for it. I think so. I think that the attitude was we, we don't want to know more than we need to know. And uh, they were pretty conscious of the need to avoid compromising the community or compromising its ability to do its job. They might have been overcautious. Congress had sort of put its hand over its eyes, say, go do what you want. And, uh, you know, here's the money, go, go do it, because intelligence has to be a kind of a rough, rough business. Now go and do it. The press seemed to mirror that attitude, regarding any scrutiny of America's secret agencies as unpatriotic. At least one newspaper article appeared hinting of the CIA mafia link but caused no sensation. I would say the few people, the few reporters who had some inkling assumed that uh, this was all okay uh, and there was no reason to, to get involved in this. I think that what you did not have at the time was a sense of indignation. But Fidel Castro was aware of Operation Mongoose and the assassination plots. With the help of Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, Castro began a major military buildup. In October 1962, a U-2 spy plane overflight of Cuba returned with photographic evidence of Soviet nuclear missile sites under construction. The United States answer to Soviet blackmail in Cuba was a quarantine of all offensive weapons being shipped from Russia to that island fortress. In Cuba itself, 100,000 men were put under emergency orders as they had been during past invasion scares. Here centered the most critical threat of global war since the surrender of Germany 17 years ago. At the White House, commando raids quickly became less important than the CIA's other function, gathering intelligence as the world faced nuclear war. Had nuclear war broken out and Soviet missiles been launched in the fall of 1962, Kennedy would have received the first warning from the North American Air Defense Command Center. NORAD is presently located a third of a mile inside Cheyenne Mountain, outside Colorado Springs. 
Since Pearl Harbor, preventing another surprise attack has been a prime concern of America's intelligence community. And this is a logical extension. A command post for a global network of technical systems that gather intelligence. In 1962, NORAD was part of America's emerging intelligence collection empire. A system that gave Kennedy weeks of warning before the Soviet missiles in Cuba became operational. Enough time to reach a peaceful resolution to the crisis. Toward the end of the acute period of crisis, the president traveled to Florida. The citation which he gave to an Air Force reconnaissance unit symbolized perhaps the wider gratitude of the nation to all the service people. The CIA intelligence function is fully vindicated in the missile crisis. But that was a justification of the intelligence function, not of the covert action function. In the midst of this, Robert Kennedy learned that the midst of this very tense situation, that uh, some of the CIA teams under Operation Mongoose were being sent into Cuba. He couldn't believe it. And that ended his uh, any illusions he had about CIA covert action. Two months after the missile crisis ended, Castro released the members of the brigade captured at the Bay of Pigs. At the Orange Bowl in Miami, the brigade presented Kennedy with their flag. The president gave a promise in return. I can assure you that this flag will be returned to this brigade in a free Havana. Just how Kennedy intended to follow through on his pledge is unclear. Operation Mongoose and its hit-and-run raids were halted after the missile crisis. But the assassination attempts against Castro continued for another year. The president's car is now turning on to Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. On November 22, 1963, a CIA asset was given a poison pen to use against Castro. On that same day, President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. We can't say who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. I'm in behind the motorcade. Thank you for the motorcade. Thank you for the motorcade. Thank you for the motorcade. I am here today to say I need your help. I cannot bear this burden alone. Lyndon Johnson wondered in private if Kennedy's death was an act of retaliation. The new president had no use for, as he put it, a murder incorporated in the Caribbean. He ordered the CIA's assassination program shut down. Johnson had managed to untangle America from Cuba. But another CIA covert war was now out of control. South Vietnam troops have stepped up their attacks on Viet Cong rebels in recent weeks. Its so-called little war in Southeast Asia is very much a major one to the South Vietnamese. Lyndon Johnson inherited JFK's CIA-supported war in Vietnam. The agency's original strategy had been to fight the communist guerrillas with their own methods. The North Vietnamese, they sent people down to organize the villagers, to get them together, found issues that they could complain about, nationalism, landlords, all that sort of thing, and to organize a force. And then their forces came in behind that. CIA advice led to the expansion of this type of warfare unit, the Green Berets, seen here today training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. In the early days of Vietnam, the CIA was loaned several hundred of these special forces to arm South Vietnamese militias. Take anything out, just nothing in here. Place the blasting cap on the detonation cord. We'll crimp it one quarter to one eighth an inch up. Place it on the cap. Turn. Hold it up where you can't see it. Crimp. Okay. But the CIA promised no quick solution to the war. Burn it! And using the agency for large-scale paramilitary operations was unpopular after the Bay of Pigs fiasco. The post-mortem of that affair was that if a paramilitary operation got very large, that CIA should turn it over to the military. 
The problem is that the military really has a different view of what to use force for. Uh, if you use force as a political, a people's war, then your idea is to add people, to add strength all the time. But you're less interested in shooting the enemy. In fact, if you can get somebody on your side who was in the enemy, that's fine. Now, when you turn it over to the military, however, the focus of the operation becomes shooting the enemy. That's what soldiers do. The Pentagon also pushed for massive air raids. The war was now based on a different concept, firepower. But the CIA did not believe this guerrilla war could be won with conventional forces and tactics. And one of the jobs of an intelligence officer is if he got bad news is to present the bad news. And it used to get intense to the extent that certain people in the administration would accuse the intelligence officers of uh, not being on the team. Well, what's the matter? Aren't you in favor of the United States? Are you in favor of the enemy? What the hell is this kind of information that you're giving us? Increasingly, the CIA found itself at odds with Johnson's advisors and the military. The White House began to ignore CIA director John McComb. I disagreed with McNamara and others who said they could see the light at the end of the tunnel. We in CIA didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, we had a very pessimistic view, uh, which uh, was sharply resented uh, by everyone right up to, the, to President Johnson. John McCone resigned as CIA director in the spring of 1965. By then, Johnson was further expanding the war, sending tens of thousands more American troops to Vietnam. Although the CIA thought the war was a mistake, it put its covert action arm at the service of the military. Instead of winning the hearts and minds of villagers, the agency was now hunting down communist insurgents, part of a controversial U.S. military intelligence operation called Phoenix. If you don't know who the enemy is, you're really not going to be able to shoot him. And uh, if you do know who he is, you can do something much better than shoot him, which is put his name up on a poster, which we used to do, and saying, we know you, Mr. So-and-so, you're the head of the tax committee of this village. Uh, we're after you. Now, if you want to, however, you can take amnesty and come, come with us. But there were also many who were killed. There were a lot killed. Most of them were killed in military actions. If uh, you go out and have a fight with a local guerrilla group, somebody's going to get killed on both sides. And you go around in the morning and you see, oh, well, there's Mr. Dong. He was, he's the local tax committee man. And he's killed. He, he, did, he wasn't captured. He didn't take amnesty. He was killed. But he wasn't murdered. At least 20,000 Vietnamese died as a result of Operation Phoenix. The real number may have been twice that figure. Phoenix hurt the communist infrastructure. But just how many among the dead were actual communist insurgents will never be known. Many suspects were tortured. Others were executed in the field. There were periods in the mid-60s when it was a brutal and terrible place, when there wasn't much government and the Indians were at the, at the gate, you know, and uh, coming in the windows and so forth, and people did a lot of very brutal things. Meanwhile, the agency's analysts continued their pessimistic reports. The massive bombing raids were not working. On the ground, communist forces continued to grow. The CIA's little war in Southeast Asia had begun in secret, without public support. Now it was the Pentagon's big war that few Americans understood, and that the United States was losing. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there. A 
telling me I got to beware. I think it's time we stop, children. What's that sound? Everybody, look what's going down. By 1967, Johnson was also losing the war at home. Public distrust of government was starting to grow as anti-war protesters took to the streets. Johnson responded by secretly ordering FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover to investigate the leaders of the unrest. For decades, Hoover had been saying yes to such White House requests via a long-standing FBI surveillance program. In the early 60s, Bill, counterintelligence was excellent, as operated in the United States by the FBI. We had something called the Security Index. The Security Index was a means of keeping tabs on persons who were, even if it was only in potens, um, communist sympathy. And you had a card in the office where that person lived and in the office where that person worked if it was different and it had to be updated every 60 days it had a photograph it had all the vital statistics and uh, at a given signal we were uh, in a position uh, should war break out or something like that a national emergency to go out and round them up just as we rounded up japanese nationals and german nationals in world war ii Keeping files on suspected communists was part of COINTELPRO, a counterintelligence program begun during the Cold War. Another standard FBI activity was electronic surveillance, bugging. The FBI surveillance in the 60s began with civil rights activists. A special target was Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. John Kennedy himself told Martin about the FBI surveillance. And um, it was, we laughed about it because when Kennedy began to talk about Hoover's surveillance, he wouldn't even talk about it in the Oval Office. He walked Martin out into the Rose Garden away from everybody and they walked around um, the back of the White House and he began to tell him of the difficulties that even he was having with the FBI. And that because they were trying to portray the movement as communist. And because there were one or two people who had some remote leftist connections, uh, he felt that he had to give them uh, permission uh, to go ahead and, and do the surveillance. And when we found bugs uh, under the pulpit, we didn't destroy them. In fact, one of Ralph Abernathy's favorite tricks was to look around the pulpit, find the microphone, and then take it out and put it on top. Hold it up and show it to the crowd, put it on top, and then he'd preach to it. And he'd call it the little doohickey. And he had a famous speech, little doohickey, I don't know where you're playing. You may be in the governor's office, you may be playing to the mayor's office, you may be playing to J. Edgar Hoover, or you may be playing to John Kennedy, but you tell them, little doohickey, that we are going to get our freedom. By 1964, the FBI had moved beyond bugging to harassment of King. Hoover wanted to destroy the civil rights leader's reputation. Secretly, the FBI sent him a letter. King, like all frauds, your end is approaching. It said, the American public will know you for what you are, an evil beast. Enclosed with the letter was an audio tape purportedly of King's lovemaking in a motel room. They put together a tape of uh, Martin and a group of ministers at the March on Washington. And they spliced it in with some tape of uh, somebody obviously having in the act of sexual intercourse. They mailed it to Martin. Uh, with the suggestion that uh, this was going to be exposed publicly 
and that he ought to kill himself and, uh, you know, avoid the humiliation. The anti-war movement was an even larger target of surveillance by the FBI and CIA. But the anti-war movement proved capable of fighting back. It revealed details of CIA involvement in domestic student groups, revelations that the American press was now willing to pursue. Immediately, there was a vast uh, uh, movement to examine everything, uh, damage control it. Uh, but I don't think there was any more, um, any, any indication that anybody felt that we shouldn't do things like this, we shouldn't do the things that were blown, but we just have to be a little more careful about how we did our covert operations. But the White House wanted riskier CIA covert actions at home. Johnson and his advisors suspected the anti-war movement had links to foreign powers. Johnson wanted the CIA to join the FBI in spying on the protesters real effort they felt had to be made to find out where the money was coming from who was generating it, and so forth the fact that over time this did not turn out to be quite as accurate as they thought it was going to be in other words that the amount of foreign involvement was relatively minor but that had to be demonstrated they wanted to be shown and it was a rather difficult problem it was a difficult problem because the CIA was forbidden by Congress to spy on Americans whether ordered by Johnson or not but CIA Director Richard Helms did not say no. He began a program called Operation Chaos. Well, this was, of course, an operation designed uh, to meet the requirement of President Johnson that we find out just how much communist support was going to these damn students who opposed the Vietnam War. So a very, very secret operation was formed. Uh, it was really very closely held because we had all been told and it was part of the basic indoctrination and training that we did not spy on fellow Americans. A major threshold had been crossed. At Lyndon Johnson's command, the CIA was now violating one of the few restrictions that Congress had placed on it. Demands on the intelligence community for domestic spying only increased after Richard Nixon's election in 1968. Nixon took office with a promise to end the Vietnam War and quell America's internal strife. To restore peace at home, Nixon turned to his intelligence agencies. The White House proposed a plan to increase domestic spying with a coordinated effort by the FBI, CIA, and the National Security Agency. There were to be more break-ins, wiretaps, and mail openings. CIA Director Helms warned at a memo that should the plan be exposed, it would prove most embarrassing for all concerned. But J. Edgar Hoover went further. He said no. So yes, there were attempts uh, by uh, various individuals to uh, pressure the FBI to uh, uh, do such things as uh, the opening of mail, the uh, the increased uh, usage of uh, wiretaps and microphones. However, uh, Mr. Hoover had learned the hard way that some attorneys general will back you up in such matters and some will not. Uh, some will say that they will back you up and support you, uh, as would other politicians. But uh, we found the hard way that uh, when the chips were down that they would not give you that support that you needed in order to uh, prevent uh, the criticism of, uh, of a wrathful public. My, my first job in the White House was to be liaison to J. Edgar Hoover. And so I marched over to the FBI and called upon him when I first got there and was treated to a two-hour harangue. I mean, just a, an incredible kind of um, uh, tour of the landscape of uh, American society uh, through the eyes of J. Edgar Hoover. And the man was clearly over the hill, as far as I could tell, uh, far past his prime living very much on his laurels, living on his alliances with the Congress, which were stainless steel, just ironclad. With Hoover refusing to cooperate, White House aide John Ehrlichman began planning the FBI director's retirement, a feat other presidents had considered but failed to accomplish. We got Richard Nixon all cranked up to remove J. Edgar Hoover one time. Yes, he said he's got to go. That's all there is to it. I'll have breakfast with him and I'll tell him. 
So we wrote out a kind of a scenario. He asked me to take notes as he dictated this thing about Edgar, the time has come, uh, you're a marvelous public servant and that sort of stuff. Uh, so I wrote all this out and had it typed up and delivered to the president. He went off the next morning to have breakfast with Hoover in the residence. Uh, he came back and I didn't hear from him. Uh, so after a while I called Bob Haldeman and I said, did he have breakfast with Hoover? He said, don't ask. And I said, um, uh, what happened? He said, don't ask. So they had breakfast. And as it turned out, and as later I found out through memos that came to me, he not only didn't fire Hoover, but he granted Hoover requests for more money for the J. Edgar Hoover building, more overseas attaches to strengthen Hoover's international intelligence capability. He gave a store away. So Hoover walked away wagging his tail, uh, far from fired. Hoover was a master politician. He had said no to a president ready to fire him and had come away from the meeting with more money for this, the new FBI national headquarters. But why had Hoover, who was a longtime associate of Nixon and had undertaken thousands of wiretaps and break-ins in the past, refused the president's request? Part of the answer had to do with Hoover's talent of reading the mood of the country. What in years past was acceptable FBI behavior had changed, and Hoover knew it. Now he was retrenching, saying no, not because the requests might be illegal, but because public knowledge of them might harm the agency he had spent nearly half a century building. A vacuum uh, developed, and ultimately that vacuum led to the forming in the Nixon administration, uh, in the executive office of the president itself, a very powerful, powerful in terms of its ability to command the resources of every intelligence, can counter intelligence agency, uh, this, uh, an organization which would do those things when ordered to do so. That organization came to be known as the Plumbers, a handful of former U.S. intelligence officers operating out of the Nixon White House. Their first assignment was uncovering the source of news leaks. This secret White House unit, led by G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt, found recruits in Miami, CIA veterans of the Bay of Pigs and Operation Mongoose. So I knew that I was working for Howard Hunt, who was a uh, retired uh, CIA agent, but I was retired before too, and I was uh, still active with the CIA, so retirement mean nothing. He came one day and he said, uh, how would you like to become operational again? So I said, I've been waiting a pretty long time for you to say that. And he says, how much time would you need? I said, give me a half hour. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we started out. I figured that by that time, I really believed at that time that we were talking CIA. And then he explained to me that this was an, an organization which was above CIA and FBI, and directly at White House level. For years, J. Edgar Hoover had carried out secret White House missions, but no longer. Hoover died in office in May of 1972. Six weeks after Hoover's funeral, the plumbers undertook their last mission, one that Hoover would almost certainly have refused to carry out. Martinez came to me and said, Barker, this is crazy what we're doing here. With it. You know, we, this, uh, I said, I agree with you. And I went up to Howard and I told him in front of Liddy, Howard, the, according to the book, we should scrub this mission. And Liddy says, I have to consult upstairs. So he left the room and he went to another room where he consulted upstairs. And he came back and says, the orders are to go ahead with the mission. So I said, well, follow me, let's go. They didn't know it at the time, but the plumbers were about to lead the Nixon White House into the history books. Hunt and Liddy set up their command post in this hotel room. The break-in was to take place across the street. But soon things began to go wrong, and Hunt and Liddy could only watch as their men were discovered and arrested. A new word was about to enter the American political vocabulary, Watergate. 
At first, it would refer only to the building that housed the Democratic National Headquarters. But it would come to mean much more, thanks to two enterprising reporters, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward. In the address books of two of the burglars who were caught in the Democratic headquarters at Watergate, there is a name of Howard Hunt, who was a, water, a White House uh, consultant, and it says uh, W. House. Well, as uh, my friend Carl Bernstein said, W. House could only be one of two things. So he said he would call the Whore House and I should call the White House. With an awakening American press on its trail, the Nixon White House scrambled to cover up its connection to the burglars. Since some of the men were Cuban ex-CIA agents, the White House tried to stop the entire investigation on grounds of national security involving the CIA's Bay of Pigs invasion. But such a scheme required CIA complicity. And so I simply said no, and I said, told Dick Waters again and again as he would come back from these meetings with John Dean, we are going to have nothing to do with this. It will ruin this agency. It will be the end of it. And I don't care whether you as an individual are willing to take a dive on behalf of the president of the White House or anybody else. I won't permit you to take the dive because it isn't going to be only you. It's going to be the whole agency that's going to be affected by this. Saying no to Nixon cost Helms his job. He was replaced as CIA director a year later by James Schlesinger. But Schlesinger also said no to helping the White House fend off the growing controversy of Watergate. Instead, he decided to find out exactly what the agency's involvement had been. Uh, Bill Colby wrote a memorandum to the staff saying that anybody who knew anything ought to come in and reveal it. I had in mind only those illegalities that might be associated with Watergate. But he wrote it in so general a way that people began popping up with information uh, from years past. And we got a collection of things which weren't very pretty reading, some of them. I didn't think, I wasn't particularly shocked by them because I didn't think they were all that far out of line for an intelligence agency. There a few things that we obviously should not have done, but uh, they were all kind of minor steps over the edge, quite frankly. When you think of what intelligence services in other countries have done and uh, kinds of activities they've involved, actually with the CIA one I thought was really quite clean. William Colby would have his own opportunity to defend the CIA record when he succeeded Schlesinger at mid-1973. By then, Richard Nixon, unable to gain CIA cooperation in blocking the Watergate investigation, was losing the struggle to save his presidency. One year later, Richard Nixon resigned. You are here to uh, say goodbye to us. And... Uh, we don't have a good word for it in English. Uh, the best is au revoir. We'll see you again. Nixon had said goodbye to the nation, but suspicions of the CIA lingered. Distrust grew when people like this man began going public. Ex-CIA officer Philip Agee wrote a book in 1975 which identified hundreds of his former colleagues worldwide. I didn't have the intention of, of naming a lot of names in the book. I was going to try to describe operations as well as I could. But as I went along working and uh, writing, I began to realize that there was no way to separate what the agency does from the people who do it. I happen to believe that torture is wrong, that disappearances of people are wrong, that the establishment and running of death squads is wrong, not only morally, but from a political point of view. And you uh, have all the documentation you'd like to find on the agency's role in the establishments of, in the establishment of death squads throughout Latin America, from the 1950s to the present. Around the time of A.G.'s accusations, word of the CIA's domestic spying leaked, 
setting off a call for presidential and congressional investigations. The sky fell down around you. Well, the thing that really did it, of course, was that made the most excitement uh, was not so much the domestic intelligence. I think that we had fairly well contained, but in the course of briefing the president, I had mentioned these cases of where CIA had attempted to assassinate foreign leaders. And in one background discussion, he, and a mistake, he blurted out something about assassinations. Well, that sent the, the rockets through the roof, and every newsman in town was after that immediately. And uh, that's what created the, the sense of uproar. President uh, Clark Clifford uh, said today that he has already been questioned by the uh, Rockefeller Commission about uh, possible CIA assassination plots. Mr. Cormier, let me say at the outset that this administration uh, does not condone under any circumstances any assassination attempts. President Ford distanced himself politically from the CIA, an agency that had carried out the secret biddings of five presidents. Some 20 years earlier, a presidential report had decided that the normal rules of combat did not apply to the CIA. They were encouraged to be more ruthless than the enemy. But in this Senate hearing room, a different standard would apply. Here, Congress, which for decades had closed its eyes to the activities of the U.S. intelligence community, would for the first time take a serious look at the sprawling secret empire it had created. And we have seen today the dark side of those activities, where many Americans who were not even suspected of crime uh, were not only spied upon, uh, but they were harassed, they were discredited, and at times endangered. Frank Church headed a Senate committee probing the intelligence community. Church took an open approach that some of his colleagues questioned. Where does the public's right to be secure override the public's right to know about something? Because in, in informing the public on a very sensitive matter, you're also informing the potential enemies of the United States. So I think you run into a philosophic conflict there. And I err on the side of, of protecting the security of the people. For 30 years, Congress had turned a blind and eye I, to intelligence. I say this now senators competed for the national spotlight as the, the intelligence hearings went public. Every television camera in town was there, and it, it was really uh, cranked up for a great show. I was told to bring the, uh, this gun that we had developed, and never used, uh, never used on people. My counsel, a very splendid guy who was with me, uh, uh, he said, look, don't you get near that thing. Uh, if it has to be handled, I will handle it. Have you brought with you um, some of those devices which would have enabled the CIA to use this poison for, we have indeed, for killing people? Don't point it at me. <laughs> Mr. Colby was supposed to bring this gun up to uh, Mr. Church. Uh, but seated next to him uh, was the ranking Republican, Barry Goldwater. And Barry reached out and grabbed the gun and held it like this and got the picture that day. Because it, it was in every picture in the United States and maybe around the world, every front page. And the next day, I confronted Goldwater. I said, Barry. Did you, did you know you were going to get your picture in the paper by taking the gun? He said, yes, I did. And I said, well, you took the gun away from the chairman. He said, I know I did. I said, where'd you learn that trick from? He said, Hubert Humphrey. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> While senators clamored for photo opportunities, Colby devised a strategy to save his agency. If you try to hide every possible imperfection, it'll blow up in your face and you'll be worse off. Uh, whereas if you can control it and be responsive and give them an honest feeling of what the whole thing is about, then I think you can survive one of these things. You've heard of the doctrine of plausible deniability. 
Yes, and I've rejected it uh, now, Senator. I say that uh, we cannot depend upon that anymore. So you don't find the work of this committee unwelcome? No, I do not. I've, as I've said to the chairman, uh, I welcome the chance to try to describe to the American people what intelligence is really about today. It, uh, it is an opportunity to show how we Americans have modernized the whole concept of intelligence. Colby's decision to cooperate was unpopular with some former CIA leaders who tried to hold on to the agency's secrets. You were specifically asked about shellfish toxins and shellfish poisons. Uh, you say it's inconceivable that a secret intelligence arm of the government has to comply with all the overt orders of the government. Is that an accurate quote or not an accurate quote? Well, if it's accurate, it shouldn't have been said. Well, now, I... I <laughs> So, looks like we're on plausible denial again, is all I can say here, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, you're never entirely sure because, after all, many of the people in the CIA have been trained to lie. That's their job, to spread propaganda overseas. Not that all of our propaganda are lies. In fact, most of it is an effort to reinforce the truth of what America stands for. But, but some of the propaganda is lies. So you're dealing with people here who have been trained to mislead when they need to. But all you can do, and all we did, was to ask as many people as many questions as we possibly could, and when we found contradictions, to pursue those contradictions by asking yet more people. Uh, if one has in one's possession or under one's control bacteriological or chemical weapons, they can be used both defensively and offensively. And by use offensively, we mean to include killing people, is that right? Well, they have the capacity to kill people if they were used in that way. Unrestrained, illegal, secret, intimidation and harassment of the, of the essential ability of Americans to participate freely in American political life shall never happen again. And suddenly it all began to roll out. Uh, the IRS was uh, targeting thousands of Americans for tax investigations in order to chill the activity on their part that they didn't like. Uh, the U.S. Army was conducting surveillance of civilians in civilian life. Um, there, was, there was a whole pattern of this running throughout government. Uh, and it was, of course, uh, once you saw what was going on, it was a shock. Uh, we saw the tip of an iceberg that could have destroyed American liberty. For any other country, the Church Committee's final report would have been an inconceivable event. It was all there to see and read. Volume after volume, revelation after revelation of the past deeds of the CIA, FBI, and the rest of America's intelligence community. But the committee did not hold America's secret agencies solely responsible. That one of the uh, findings of the Church Committee was that it was not out of control that it was under too much control of the president, perhaps. Uh, the Church Committee criticized the Congress for not doing its job of proper supervision over the years. I think the critical point would have been if church, the Church Committee had done a good job and taken some steps to uh, effectively either stop or put extreme limits on covert activity. I think there was a sentiment in the public to stop it. We could have gotten out of that pernicious business. The, the real story would have been to do an exhaustive investigation into some of the COVID ops and make some of them more of it public and also try and get an effective ban on some, at least restrict the operations in some way, and they fail to do that. I think that the church committee hearings were not harmful. They simply made the agency look ridiculous in many respects, made it look evil in other respects. And when all was said and done, what did it achieve? Where is the legislation, the great piece of legislation that was going to come out of the church committee hearings? I haven't seen it. It hasn't passed the Congress as far as I'm aware. Richard Helms became a casualty of the struggle between Congress and the White House. He had denied to Congress that the CIA and the Nixon White House had intervened in Chile. In 1977, he was given a suspended sentence for not testifying fully and completely. Mr. President, I present to you an intelligence agency and community of dedicated professionals. William Colby became a casualty, too. He was fired by President Ford. The job of director of the CIA went to 
George Bush. I will not turn my back on the past, for from the past we've learned a lot, of, a lot about what an intelligence agency must do to maintain the confidence of the people in an open society. Congress tried to restore confidence in the intelligence community through stricter oversight to ensure that it too would abide by the nation's laws. After setting up permanent committees, another law passed which required formal presidential approval of covert acts and timely notification of Congress. In the process, the secret agencies found themselves no longer solely under the control of the president. For a while, it seemed, it would be easier for intelligence agencies to say no to the White House. It did not work out that way. Do you solemnly swear that in the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And you'll notice that the same thing happened again in the Reagan administration. The Congress very foolishly attempted to interdict the Central Intelligence Agency from carrying out one of its primary functions, and as a result, they formed another group. This time, not in the executive office of the president, that didn't work the last time, so this time they did it in the NSC. Next time, they'll run it out of Red Cross headquarters, but they will run it because it has to be done, and it will be done. Secret intelligence was made possible by public television stations and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding has been provided by United Airlines, rededicated to giving you the service you deserve. Schools, colleges, public libraries, and other organizations may purchase video cassettes of this series by calling 1-800-424-7963. The companion book to this series, Secret Intelligence, is available in bookstores or through this toll-free number. To order, call 1-800-441-3000. The hardbound volume is $19.95 plus handling. And please, have your credit card ready.
January 20th, 1981. On this day, Ronald Reagan replaced Jimmy Carter as President of the United States. I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will to the best Carter of had come to office determined to curb the excesses of the CIA and other U.S. intelligence agencies. Reagan believed the result had crippled America's espionage capabilities. Yet both of their intelligence policies failed them. Iran would play the pivotal role in those failures. Carter's attempts to rescue American diplomatic hostages ended in tragedy in the Iranian desert and doomed his hopes of re-election. The rescue attempt also led to the formation of a highly secret Pentagon anti-terrorist unit, the Special Operations Division. As we shall see, from this unit sprang the idea of the Enterprise, an unaccountable group of secret warriors created by the Reagan White House to conduct covert operations first in Central America and then throughout the world. An existing off-the-shelf, self-sustaining, stand-alone entity that could perform certain activities on behalf of the United States. From the zealous men who ran the secret enterprise would come the controversial affair now known as Iran-Contra, a government crisis not only of men, but of the Constitution itself. In this, the final hour of our series, we'll see the disturbing consequences of what happens when the pendulum of U.S. espionage swings from one extreme to another. America's new president, himself a former CIA director, will have to determine just what role America's secret world of intelligence will play in pursuing his policies. What he decides may very well determine the outcome of his presidency. In January 1979, after months of rioting, the Shah of Iran was overthrown. Ayatollah Khomeini seized power in the name of Islam. The United States was vilified as the great Satan. Soon after, the U.S. Embassy was seized. There were open lines to Tehran, and we had these disembodied voices from the other side of the world coming through to us describing a really terrible situation. There were uh, militants beating on the door outside their... Uh, the vault that they had uh, they had withdrawn to uh, there was uh, things were getting very hot they were burning uh, paper inside trying to destroy classified documents and what they couldn't tell and one never can tell I'd been in a vault like that once uh, uh, was whether the heat was coming from inside or whether in fact the embassy was on fire so they didn't know at all what their status was and they were frightened uh, I mean they were they feared for their lives and they had good reason to fear for their lives as Iranian militants stormed the embassy, American hostages were taken. They would be held captive 444 agonizing days. These events took the United States and its intelligence agencies by surprise. Only six months earlier, the CIA had reported to Carter that Iran is not in a revolutionary or even pre-revolutionary situation. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. The Iranian Revolution was a 
major intelligence failure on the part of the United States. The knowledge that there was trouble in Iran was uh, universal. Uh, nobody had any doubt that uh, the Shah was in trouble, that his regime was facing a challenge. Uh, there were, after all, riots in the streets every 40 days that could hardly be overlooked. The question was not whether there is trouble in Iran. The question in making policy was how far is it going to go? What is the outcome of this going to be? And so it involved a determination about whether the Shah could realistically expect to survive that challenge or whether he was going to go under. And that was where the failure came in, was in estimating what the effects of this were, how deep it went, and what it was likely to do as far as policy was concerned. Iran was America's worst intelligence failure since Pearl Harbor. But how had this breakdown of analysis happened? Blind support of the Shah was one reason. The intelligence policies of Carter was another. He won the presidency as an outsider, a leader untarnished by Vietnam, Watergate, and the excesses of the CIA. At CIA headquarters, he announced his intention to reform the agency. I'll do all I can, working with past directors who are here, and the Secretary of Defense who is here, and the Attorney General who's here, and other leaders who are here, to let the American people have an accurate assessment and the deepest possible commitment that every action of the intelligence community now and in the future will be legal and proper. Carter was determined to minimize secret actions by secret agents, to replace humans wherever possible with spy machines. There were many to choose from. New and dazzling ones like the KH-11 satellite, and all reliables, among them the high-flying U-2 and the world's fastest airplane, the SR-71. The eagerness to exploit this technology was shared by Carter's CIA director, Admiral Stansfield Turner. It was clear to people in American intelligence that the technical systems for collecting data had overwhelmed the old spy systems. That meant that all of us running intelligence turned in different directions. And this had happened long before my time, but we were just beginning to really appreciate that the revolution had happened when I got there. We turned in different directions when we had a problem, when we had a crisis. Our instinct was to go for one of these technical systems and say, I want some information right now about what's happening. But many CIA officers resented Turner and his emphasis on machines and resigned. Robert Simmons was one of them. I think that when uh, the Carter administration came into power, they had a deep distrust of the intelligence community, in particular, uh, a distrust of the clandestine service. They weren't comfortable with dealing with people who led secret lives. But human source collection, talking to somebody in a foreign country, debriefing a defector, uh, talking to prisoners of war, these are vital elements uh, of the whole intelligence picture. And I felt that the Carter administration in particular uh, and Admiral Turner were focusing much more on the technical aspects of intelligence collection and much less on human source collection. And so I quit in disgust. Uh, I was frustrated by the situation that I was faced with, and I think many of my colleagues were frustrated as well. Those worries about over-reliance on technology were shared by Carter's national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski. The American intelligence is about the best in the world when it comes to the scientific, technical dimensions of intelligence. But it's certainly not up to par when it comes to making sound political judgments, when it comes to cultivating and nourishing important political relationships that yield intelligence. What are you going to do? Uh, Turner quickly learned the limitations of technology when he was unable to produce information requested by the president. Well, there was a small war in a remote country pair of remote countries and the president 
I think more as an experiment than anything because he was new and I was new, said he'd like to see some pictures of what was going on. And I told the satellite people, quick, get us some pictures for the president. I was embarrassed day after day, week after week, when we did not have any. And it turned out that the instructions to the satellite people uh, were misinterpreted. I was uh, several weeks before I finally got some pictures for the president. Very embarrassing. But it was typical of the problem we had. We were just really coming into this whole new age and learning to give the right instructions, learning to use these devices to best advantage. But pictures, even when in hand, cannot divine thoughts and intentions. This, the United States would learn in Iran, a place teeming with U.S. listening devices for eavesdropping on the nearby Soviet Union, but a country where the CIA had virtually no human assets. No one who was probing inside the minds of the Iranian people. The Shah reigned because of U.S. support, but behind the pageantry lay political repression, even torture, carried out by Iran's CIA-trained secret police, Savak. This fact, U.S. presidents from Eisenhower to Carter overlooked. Yet, despite America's unwavering support, Iran's ruler was deeply suspicious of the nation that had brought him to power. In 1953, the United States had conspired to put the Shah back on the throne uh, when he was under uh, challenge in what has been referred to as a counter coup, a covert action. That stuck, of course, in the Shah's mind, and he was constantly aware after that and feared that the United States could do the reverse, that if we disagreed with him, we could uh, take him off the throne as well. And so he wanted to do as much as possible to keep us out of his domestic activities. And I think he succeeded uh, very well in, in getting us out of those activities. We quit looking uh, at the opposition uh, in Iran and, in effect, ended up being very badly prepared for what came along. The White House was badly prepared in another way. With few political resources inside Iran, there were even fewer options for rescuing the American hostages. Carter, who had come to office wary of covert operations, found himself turning more and more to America's secret warriors for solutions. We spent a great deal of time agonizing over what kind of a charter ought to be promulgated under which the intelligence activities would be conducted. I think subsequently, but not too long thereafter, the president started approving quite a few covert activities. In desperation, Carter approved a military mission to free the American hostages. U.S. helicopters, loaded with Delta commandos, flew through the night of April 24th, 1980, to a rendezvous spot, codenamed Desert One. There, they met disaster. Late yesterday, I canceled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran to position our rescue team for a later withdrawal of American hostages. As our team was withdrawing after my order to do so, two of our American aircraft collided on the ground following a refueling operation in a remote desert location in Iran. To my deep regret, eight of the crewmen of the two aircraft which collided were killed. The wreckage in the Iranian desert became a symbol of Carter's inability to respond to world events. It was also a humiliation for the Pentagon Special Forces, which resolved never to be caught in such a failure again. 
The new American president agreed. Ronald Reagan promised a new era, a time when America would reassert its world leadership and aggressively fight terrorism and communism. I am. Did you place your left hand on the Bay of Bible and raise your right hand? It was a position that came naturally to this veteran of the Cold War. During the Red Scare, Reagan was president of the Screen Actors Guild in Hollywood. That uh, small clique uh, has been referred to, has been discussed as more or less following the tactics that we uh, associate with the Communist Party. Motivated by his concern that communists were infiltrating the movie industry, Reagan became a secret informant for the FBI. His code name was T-10. He also solicited contributions for Crusade for Freedom, the Radio Free Europe and Asia campaign, actually backed by the CIA. Stop the spread of communism in the Far East. The Crusade for Freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Join now by sending your contributions to General Clay, Crusade for Freedom, Empire State Building, New York City. Or join in your local community. In 1981, the presidency of the United States provided Reagan with a powerful platform for his fervent anti-communism. Those activist views were shared by his campaign manager, William Casey, who Reagan appointed CIA director with cabinet rank. Never before had a president and his CIA director enjoyed such a close personal relationship. Well, two things are important. It's important that the president have confidence in uh, his intelligence chief, and, and uh, it's important that he can they can talk to each other when they need to. It's uh, important that the intelligence chief know uh, oh, is in a position to judge the president's uh, interests and his evaluations and. Uh, see that he gets the information he needs and that he has it properly presented. Casey wanted to be the Secretary of State and uh, he was not going to get that because he couldn't speak that well. Because he was not the kind of uh, articulate spokesman that Ronald and Nancy Reagan thought Alexander Haig would be. So Casey had to get something. Uh, CIA was ideal. He was the intellectual godfather, if you will, of the idea of we are not going to get pushed around in this world anymore. We're going to get the upper hand. And he set a tone of there are no limits. Casey had learned the trade craft of intelligence in World War II as a young OSS officer fighting against Nazi Germany. He brought that same sense of mission to the CIA, often willing to rush in where others feared to go. I became a little bit disenchanted because it seemed to me that Casey was living in the past and that he was trying to recreate the atmosphere and the operational tactics which OSS had been using against the Germans in 1944 and 1945. And I felt simply that the times were different, the conditions were different, the requirements were different. And it didn't seem to me that Casey was facing up to the requirements of the 80s. Just days after his swearing in, Casey authorized money and arms to battle Libya's Muammar Gaddafi in Chad. That was followed by clandestine support of anti-communist guerrillas in Cambodia. In Soviet-occupied Afghanistan, he increased CIA support for the Mujahideen. He also supported the funding of a new spy satellite system that would be able to see through clouds and in the dark. But Casey's main agenda was dominated by the growing communist movement in Central America and terrorist attacks in the Middle East. We have to show strength and be prepared to act with strength when it's necessary, when, you're in the, when you're, your reputation and your uh, national security requires it, when you protect us, it is required to protect your citizens as is perhaps an occasion in the, against a terrorist threat today. Threat would become nightmare for Casey when Islamic terrorists struck in Lebanon. This is a picture of the U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut, taken at the moment of explosion. 
The truck bomb attack in the fall of 1983 killed 241 Marines. Not so many Americans had died since the Vietnam War. But the carnage, it turns out, could have been avoided. Months before, a U.S. military intelligence team was sent into Beirut to assess marine security measures. The team found serious flaws. Marine sentries without bullets in their rifles. Barriers removed for the convenience of supply trucks. Far worse, in an investigation launched after the event, the team learned that intelligence existed to indicate an impending attack, but nothing was done. Now, retired Lieutenant Colonel William Cowan was a member of that team. The intelligence was there to indicate that a bombing was imminent. The U.S. Army Special Forces Group had a mobile training team working directly with Lebanese in East Beirut. Uh, they had been warned four or five days before the bombing by their Lebanese contacts that a bomb had been moved into the city in preparation for a bombing on the Marine compound. There's no question in my mind that there was intelligence there to support the Marines being ready. There's also no question that that word never got to the commander of the Marine forces. We suffered those casualties because the intelligence system did not work in Beirut. The bombing of the, of the Marine barracks in Beirut was one of those seminal events uh, for Casey, for the Reagan administration. Not only was it a, an intelligence and military problem and a diplomatic problem, it was a political problem for Casey because he had said, we're going to turn the intelligence agencies around. We are not going to let anyone be tougher than we are. And in September 1984, there was a second bombing of the uh, embassy annex in Beirut. Now, that is right before the 84 election. Uh, Casey went bananas. So did the Pentagon. After the attack on its U.S. Marine barracks, the Pentagon sent its intelligence team back into war-torn Beirut. Their mission? Develop a plan for U.S. retaliation. They roamed throughout this dangerous city gathering intelligence. The recommendations were first submitted to the CIA station chief, William Buckley. We briefed Bill Buckley, the chief of station in Beirut, who was later kidnapped, uh, brutally tortured, and ultimately died. We briefed our recommendations to him. He was ecstatic. Uh, he was, uh, I think Bill was pleased as he told us, uh, thank God somebody's finally looking at this thing and thinking about what we can do first. We went back to European command, briefed the recommendations there, very favorable reply, response, excuse me. And then we came back to the Pentagon and as with our previous report, we submitted a report and put it into the bureaucracy. And it died. Just what type of retaliation Cowan's report recommended is classified. But his personal feelings echo back to solutions rejected in the past. We have a policy in this country of not assassinating people. Uh, somewhere along the line, though, uh, that policy maybe needs to be reviewed, not on a blanket basis. Certainly for sheer political reasons, we wouldn't want to do it. But when it comes time to speaking to the deaths of Americans, who we know are directly attributable to a small number of people, I don't think there are too many members of Congress who are going to yell loud and long about the fact that we might selectively want to pay back some people who have a deep hatred for the United States who would kill any one of us sitting here if they had the opportunity. And I'm not sure I can justify, nor should we justify, why we can't, uh, why we can't take some kind of action against those kinds of people on a selective basis. But who would decide on a selective basis and in secret who should live and who should die? Such troubling questions led to a 1977 presidential order banning foreign political assassinations. The Soviet Union has no such restriction. The KGB's reaction to terrorism in the Middle East has been swift and ruthless. As in the 1984 case of four Soviet diplomats taken hostage in Beirut by the Islamic radical group Hezbollah. 
of the Soviets decided to speak the language of the radical Hezbollah uh, in Beirut. Uh, they took a relative of one of the Hezbollah leaders, uh, cut off his testicles, put the testicles in his mouth, shot him, uh, sent him back. Very shortly after that, uh, the Soviet diplomats were released. The significance of this was that Casey uh, realized that the Soviets could be tough could deal on exactly the same terms uh, that Hezbollah dealt, and they were victorious. So Casey decided in 1985, when we could not uh, stop the car bombings uh, of our embassy facilities and other facilities in Beirut, Casey decided to speak the language of Hezbollah and got the Saudi intelligence service to try to assassinate Sheikh Fadlala, the leader of Hezbollah and sent a car bomb uh, to the apartment complex where he lived, hoping to kill him. Killed instead 80 innocent people. Uh, that was a pretty big shock to Casey. Uh, he did not have the CIA institutionally involved in this. He did it. He did a deal with the Saudi ambassador here, and then the Saudis funded the operation. The CIA adamantly denies any involvement in the 1985 bombing of Hezbollah headquarters. The repetition of this false allegation, the CIA wrote to us, perpetuates the lie and further endangers American lives at terrorist hands overseas. Besides the bombings in Beirut, there were other setbacks for Casey in 1985, known as the Year of the Spy. Not since the Red Scare of the 50s had so many spies inside America been uncovered. This CIA officer, Larry Chin, spied for the Chinese. The National Security Agency's Ronald Pelton sold highly sensitive eavesdropping information to the Soviets. The Walker family spy ring sold naval secrets to the KGB for years. Edward Lee Howard, a former CIA officer, escaped to Moscow even while under FBI surveillance. Richard Miller, a counterintelligence specialist for the FBI, was not so lucky. Hidden cameras and microphones helped lead to his arrest. It's a gray link. It's a gray link. Since the days of J. Edgar Hoover, technology has played a major role in the FBI's counterintelligence activities. But high-tech spying has gone way beyond wiretaps. Today, virtually no conversation is safe from eavesdropping. Anyone who's ever seen a TV detective show knows to check the lamps for bugs. But listening devices have become far more sophisticated than this. On the other side of this wall, a small bug is listening to everything I say. Without penetrating the wall, or leaving a mark. It's a compact microphone which turns this room into a recording studio. But even if you find all the listening devices in this room or next door, you may not be safe. For several hundred feet away in a motel room, someone is still listening. Using a beam of light, a laser, they have turned this window into a giant microphone. And they can hear everything that is said in this room. Using Distance and darkness are no longer obstacles to these tools of surveillance. Here an infrared telescope sees in the night. But high technology combined with aggressive FBI agents pose a danger, the potential for abuse. That's always uh, an area you have to be sensitive to and a balance you have to strike. And, and our focus is on the intelligence officer. And I mentioned in general terms the numbers by saying that a good one-third of the, the Soviet Soviet bloc representatives are going to be intelligence officers. That's where our focus is. We attempt to create a net in which they have to operate that makes it extremely difficult. We can't, we don't have the resources or the inclination 
to try to focus on Americans. I mean, we can't be out surveilling uh, American citizens and members of the public. Uh, our focus is on the intelligence officer, and that's where it's going to stay. But even as the head of the FBI's counterintelligence division was making this statement, the Bureau was surveilling American citizens. The focus of the investigation, which began in 1983, was CISPIS, Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, an activist, peace, and human rights group which the FBI suspected of being controlled by communist foreign agents and of planning terrorist acts in the United States. This FBI investigation echoed back to abuses of the past when groups opposed to another war, Vietnam, were targeted by the Bureau. Stop FBI the protests against the war in Central America have been fewer in number than during Vietnam, but the FBI's response was the same. Open dissent with White House policy brought secret FBI investigations. In this investigation, they, con they used a variety of, of means to um, infiltrate the organization, put informers and agents into CISPUS, they surveilled meetings, they photographed demonstrators, um, took license plate numbers, made inquiries of banks and other institutions to find out about people, had um, FBI agents attempt to interview members of the organization. And then this, uh, this investigation expanded to include about 200 organizations ranging from the Mary Knowles sisters to the United Auto Workers, which be it became a, an investigation almost of any anybody or any organization that was opposed to the Reagan administration policy in Central America. In the end, the FBI investigation produced 17 volumes of reports, but not a single indictment. This kind of FBI surveillance of Americans exercising their freedom of dissent is disturbing to Congressman Don Edwards, chairman of the House Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights and a former FBI agent. I think that the CISPUS uh, experience, which is very unfortunate and hurt the FBI, and also hurt a lot of innocent people, remember. A lot of names got bandied around, and CISPUS got hurt, damaged severely by things that the FBI did and said and published. Uh, I think it was an aberration, and I, and I hope it is. We usually find out uh, when they go too far, and CISPUS is an example of the FBI um, not examining what it's doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and perhaps uh, Congress ourselves not uh, maintaining a close enough oversight scrutiny on what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to shedding light on questionable FBI activities, the CISPUS investigation has added to the ongoing national debate over U.S. policies in Central America. America's secret war against communist Nicaragua began early in the Reagan administration when CIA Director Casey proposed the recruitment of 500 exiles to carry out guerrilla operations. The Contras quickly expanded to number in the thousands. People just couldn't take seriously this sort of threat that the Nicaraguan regime are someday going to be banging up against the borders of Texas. But this was just a point on which we uh, didn't agree. In fact, at one time, Casey offered me the position of being chief of Central American operations. And what did you say? I told him, thank you very much. I've had my Vietnam. Casey pushed ahead with his secret war, even though Congress had passed legislation known as the Boland Amendments, prohibiting CIA activities aimed at overthrowing the Nicaraguan government. In 1984, CIA teams mined Nicaragua harbors and attacked fuel facilities. This covert action deeply eroded trust between Casey and Capitol Hill, as witnessed by former CIA officer Robert Simmons, then a member of the Senate intelligence staff. I think people felt uh, that they uh, had been uh, 
screwed by the administration. In 1984, the uh, committees had not been notified properly uh, with regard to the mining of Nicaraguan harbors. Uh, and as a, res as a consequence of that, uh, Director Casey apologized to the committees. It would seem to me that, that uh, Director Casey and his staff and people at the White House would have learned from that experience. What Casey saw is that Congress provides the money. Uh, all of these people who are unsophisticated Neanderthals about intelligence and in, in, in this need to spy and uh, the need to conduct operations. He looked at them and he said, uh, they're not in my league. And so he minimized disclosure, minimized contact. While Congress struggled to control Casey's CIA, another secret group operating out of the basement of the Pentagon escaped congressional scrutiny. Known as the Special Operations Division, or SOD, it was created as an anti-terrorist unit following the failed rescue mission in Iran. Much of what is known about SOD is because of the investigative work of this journalist, Stephen Emerson, who obtained thousands of pages of SOD secret documents through the Freedom of Information Act. The Special Operations Division became the new center for intelligence and counter-terrorist activities in the Pentagon. In effect, it became a mini-CIA for the Pentagon, established in the basement, controlling half a dozen new counter-terrorism units, Names such as Sea Spray, Quick Reaction Team, Yellow Fruit, Intelligence Support Activity, heavily classified. To this day, the Army does not acknowledge their existence, but all extremely capable, very aggressive in, the, in accomplishing their mission, the mission of fighting terrorism and guerrilla subversion around the world. These units were ready to go anywhere and do anything. The bugging of Noriega in Panama, KGB cars in West Germany, the tracking down of a kidnapped U.S. general held by the Red Brigade in Italy. They were all over the world, and uh, they felt they had a mandate to be all over the world. After all, the CIA was, was a shadow of what it used to be, and the Special Operations Division was literally stepping into a void. SOD may have been stepping into a void, but it was doing so with enormous resources. Tom Golden was in charge of financial control for a subunit of SOD called Yellow Fruit. The funding was almost unlimited. Uh, I don't know of any time that we were in a position where we needed money. Uh, the money was offered and we had to find ways to spend it, basically. In the fall of 1983, some units of the SOD participated in the U.S. invasion of Grenada. By then, the secret team's existence was known to National Security Council staffer Oliver North. It is believed that North, who worked closely with CIA Director Casey, quickly recognized how useful this super-secret group could be to the CIA in Central America. The SOD located in the basement of the Pentagon could be used to circumvent the legislative requirement that all covert operations be reported to Congress. Thus, the SOD could become a convenient vehicle to be used by the agency to conduct operations which it couldn't get approved, or in funding operations for which it had no money, like support for the Contras in Nicaragua. One of the most severe and scandalous projects ever embarked upon the U.S. military was a project called Yellow Fruit. It was a backdoor CIA effort to aid the Contras in Central America and to perform other operations that Congress never would have supported. And the CIA saw Yellow Fruit and the Special Operations Division as a magical fountain of support with unlimited money, unlimited weapons, Black money, black cape transportation capability. Basically, another CIA without any of the reporting, quote, problems that had triggered the problems of the late 1970s. Some of the units actually participated in strafing Nicaraguan targets, bombarding airfields and oil fields, 
in an attempt to disrupt and possibly dislodge the Sandinista regime. But Tom Golden blew the whistle on Operation Yellow Fruit. Uh, normally in intelligence operations you're advanced a certain amount of money to operate with. Uh, once you spend that money, uh, then you must submit a voucher to, uh, to account for it. What I found was very unusual in this unit is people had been advanced as much as uh, $150,000 and had never submitted a voucher for accountability. I eventually went to my superiors and reported what I believed to be abuse of funds and uh, possibly fraud. Uh, that eventually was, uh, was surfaced to the leadership of the Army, who ordered a massive investigation into the uh, special operations community in general. This is Arlington Hall, Virginia, headquarters for U.S. Army Intelligence. Here, members of the SOD team were court-martialed in a soundproof room. Two SOD members are now serving prison sentences for financial fraud. But what was most important about these trials was not the discovery of another case of misuse of government funds, but the revelation that the SOD's yellow fruit served as the blueprint for what William Casey called the Enterprise. The Special Operations Division and Yellow Fruit had a unique access to equipment, material, offshore bank accounts, a secret clandestine uh, army slash CIA aviation unit, a clandestine ship overseas to provide transportation, uh, access to material and weapons, all the seeds that would later basically erupt in the Iran-Contra affair and be known as the Enterprise. And I believe that Yellow Fruit and the Special Operations Division were both being groomed by the CIA and the National Security Council to serve as the cornerstone of the Enterprise to perform operations in Central America and elsewhere that would never be accounted to Congress. The Pentagon shut down its enterprise while still in its embryonic form. But William Casey and Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North set about creating it again. Not only were there Contras to support in Central America, there were hostages to be freed in the Middle East, including one of the CIA's own kidnapped Beirut station chief, William Buckley. Casey, determined to get Buckley back, tried a new approach, bribery. Casey was in a mode at that point uh, in the spring of 1985 when he said, bribery stops terrorism. The car bombings were the number one, really the, the primary terrorist problem. The second one was the hostages. So they decided, let's bribe the hostages back. Who has influence over the people who hold the hostages? Iran. What do they want? Money? No. Food, medicine, scholarships? No. Arms? Yes. Thus, the Iranian arms sales. First word of the secret Iran arms sales came from a Lebanese publication in November 1986. Ronald Reagan, in an address to the nation, denied the report. A charge has been made that the United States has shipped weapons to Iran as ransom payment for the release of American hostages in Lebanon. That the United States undercut its allies and secretly violated American policy against trafficking with terrorists. Those charges are utterly false. But less than two weeks later, U.S. Attorney General Edwin Meese made a startling announcement. Certain monies which were received in the transaction were uh, taken and made available to the forces in Central America which are opposing the Sandinista government there. This announcement set off a major congressional investigation, what has become known as Iran-Contra. Colonel North, please rise. More than any other witness, Marine Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North has come to represent America's continuing dilemmas between secrecy and democracy. Nothing but the truth, so help you God, I do. Please be sure. Through the hearings, it became clear that after Congress had shut off support for the Contras, Reagan had turned to his national security staff to find other help. 
That request changed the mission of the NSC from an advisory council into an operational group, not unlike a mini-CIA. It was a gung-ho assignment given to a can-do Marine. This lieutenant colonel is not going to challenge a decision of the commander-in-chief for whom I still work, and I am proud to work for that commander-in-chief. And if the commander-in-chief tells this lieutenant colonel to go stand in the corner and sit on his head, I will do so. North, with the collaboration of National Security Advisors Robert McFarlane and later Admiral John Poindexter, first raised funds from other countries and private individuals to support the Contras. I told him that I was interested in, um, uh, in seeing what I could do, and I asked him for his recommendation. And uh, did North, uh, subsequent to the meeting, provide you the Swiss bank account name and number to which your payment should be made? Yes, he did. With money in hand, this man, retired Air Force General Richard Secord, was recruited. Together, these three men set about creating Casey's dream of the Enterprise, a secret organization accountable to no one, capable of carrying out covert operations anywhere around the world. The director was interested in the ability to go to an existing, as he put it, off-the-shelf, self-sustaining, stand-alone, self-financing entity, independent of appropriated monies, and capable of conducting uh, activities similar to the ones that we had conducted here. There were other countries that were suggested that might be the, the beneficiaries of that kind of support, other activities. You understood that the CIA is funded by the United States government, correct? That is correct. You understood that the United States government put certain limitations on what the CIA could do. Correct? That is correct. And I ask you today, to all you've gone through, are you not shocked that the Director of Central Intelligence is proposing to you the creation of an organization to do these kinds of things outside of his own organization? Counsel, I can tell you I'm not shocked. I don't, I don't see that it was necessarily inconsistent with the laws, regulations, uh, statutes, and all that obtain. Despite a White House policy of making no concessions to terrorists, the Enterprise sold weapons to Iran in the hopes of gaining the release of American hostages. Weapons which the Iranians would use in their war with Iraq. The profits from these sales were diverted to fund the Contra War against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. that idea of using the Ayatollah Khomeini's money to support the Nicaraguan freedom fighters as a good one. I still do. I don't think it was wrong. I think it was a neat idea. And I came back and I advocated that and we did it. There is nothing more to fear for a democracy than the scheme Casey called the Enterprise. It amassed its own airplanes, pilots, airfields, navy, communications network, and secret bank accounts. It was answerable to no one, and known but to a handful of men. Men who had decided they alone knew what was best for America. Self-sustaining, lacking restrictions or accountability, the Enterprise's very existence was a subversion of the Constitution of the United States. It is an elitist vision of government that trusts no one not the people, not the Congress, and not the cabinet. It is a vision of a government operated by persons con convinced they have a monopoly on truth. But the truth was not what Congress had been told months prior when it had suspected inappropriate actions on the part of the NSC. I participated in the preparation of documents for the Congress 
that were erroneous, misleading, evasive, and wrong. I misled the Congress. I mis at that meeting. At that meeting. Face to face. Face to face. You made false statements to them about your activities in support of the Contras. I did. To many observers, though, the Congressional Oversight Committees seemed all too willing to allow themselves to be deceived. I don't think they really take on the intelligence community in any serious sense. I'll give you an example. I did a story in July of 86 for the New York Times about the fact that the NSA is, was working together with the British, its British equivalent, the GCHQ, um, and they were together working uh, to collect information on the African National Congress and its travels outside of Southern Africa, and we relay, relaying that to the South Africans with whom we have a liaison. <coughs> so in secret, the committee has a hearing. In great secrecy, they bring in some top people who say no, there's nothing to it, end of investigation. I mean, I wouldn't report a story that way. I just wouldn't, you know. I mean, if that's how they do it, and that's the only experience I have firsthand, I've, I've heard that that's a normal experience. You know, that's not, that's not the way to run it. If you're supposed to be oversight, you're supposed to develop independent contacts, independent, uh, have an independent ability to reach in. And they don't. They get in trouble, they have to write a letter to Mama and say, come in and tell me what you got, Mama. And that doesn't make sense. They can't be afraid to learn what's happening. They cannot be afraid of knowledge. And some people are afraid of knowledge because if you have knowledge, then you have to act. And so uh, it's sometimes more comfortable to not know. And I think there was a degree of that, in my view, during the Iran-Contra affair. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased that members of the committee that I represented, the Senate committee, were prepared to say quite bluntly and directly that they felt that Congress did not do as, an effective, as effective a job as it should have. That doesn't excuse the lying, doesn't condone the shredding of documents, but Congress has to be more energetic. There has been much criticism of the Iran-Contra hearings themselves for being too narrow in focus, too hastily prepared, and too quickly concluded. What other activities had been undertaken? Had drugs been sold to support the Contras? What had been the role of Ronald Reagan or his vice president, George Bush? The answers to such questions may never be known, for much of the evidence of the enterprise was destroyed or shredded. Correct. And you were aware, were you not, sometime during the day on Friday, November 21st, that the Attorney General's people were going to come in and look at documents over the weekend? That is correct. And you shredded documents before they got there? I would prefer to say that I shredded documents that day like I did on all other days, but perhaps with increased intensity, that is correct. So that the people you were keeping these documents from, the ones that you shredded, were representatives of the Attorney General of the United States? Well, they work for him. William Casey, the architect of the enterprise, was never to testify. He died of a brain tumor in 1987 as the hearings were being held. If there's a tragic part to Casey, and I guess there is, it is that he ultimately didn't realize what this country is about, that we are different, that yes, we will have an intelligence agency, yes, we will do things in secret, but those uh, nation-defining activities like war can't be done in secret, that we can't go out and try to get the Saudi intelligence service to kill people we don't like because in America we don't do that in secret because that tells the world who we are it tells us who we are with the destruction of evidence by North and Poindexter and the death of William Casey, all of the facts of Iran-Contra may never be known. But this much is clear. In Iran-Contra, administration officials, believing they alone knew what was best, 
conducted secret foreign policy in violation of congressional laws. But Iran-Contra is only the latest episode in a continuing struggle between American democracy and the secret intelligence empire it has created. A disdain for the law, impatience for results, and the conviction that it can't be wrong if nobody knows. These were the mark of the CIA's disaster at the Bay of Pigs, the FBI's long history of illegal surveillance of American dissidents, and the National Security Agency's unauthorized monitoring of private communications. Who is there to protect us from America's secret warriors? Who will watch the watchers? number of ethical questions raised in these shows. We'll learn about ethics in America from the point of view of some judges, columnists, and politicians, and whether and how to defend a killer on ethics in America next. And that'll be followed by fighting ministers about people in Pittsburgh who took on the steel companies when they wanted to shut down the factories and invest in lucrative foreign firms. That'll be at 11 o'clock tonight. Well, tonight's final chapter of Secret Intelligence, at least so far, will be shown again Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Tomorrow evening, we continue with Between the Wars, Eric Severides.